Good morning, one and all. Good morning. Good morning. Esteemed dignitary, trustee of Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan and chairperson of the governing body of Bhavan's Hazarimal Somani College, Sri Mukul Sunawala Ji, principal of our college, Professor Dr. S. V. Rathod, keynote speaker, Professor Dr. A. B. Pandit, speakers at the plenary sessions, national and international delegates, and teaching fraternity from various colleges and universities across the globe. On behalf of Bhavan's Hazarimal Samani College of Arts and Science and Jairam Das Patel College of Commerce and Management Studies, I, Dr. Rupa Deshmukhya, Assistant Professor in the Department of English, heartily welcome you all to the inaugural session of the three-day international conference uh, on Fundamental and Applied Sciences, ICFAS 2021, organized by the Faculty of Science in collaboration with the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, IQAC. As per the tradition, we begin all our programs with the Bhavan's prayer. May I now request the IQAC coordinator, Dr. Manjusha Patwardhan, to recite the Bhavan's prayer and request all of you to kindly rise for the same. Thank you, Rupa, ma'am. Oh, Purnamadaha, Purnamidam, Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishate Hariyo Ishavasyamidam Sarvam Yet Kincha jagatya jagat Ken tyakte na bunji thaha Magridhakasya svidanam Mukam karoti vachalam Pangum langhayate girim Yat krupatva maham vande Paramanandamadhavam Yakundendu tusharaharadhavala Yashubhrava stravruta Yavina varadanda mandita kara Yashweta Padmasana Ya Brahma Chuta Shankara Prabhuti Bhir Devai Sadavandita Samam Patu Saraswati Bhagavati Nishesh Jadya Paha Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvinavadhitamastu Ma Vidvishavahe Shanti he, Shanti he, Shanti he. Thank you, Dr. Patwardhan, for that melodious rendition. Thank you all. May I now request the trustee of Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan and chairperson of governing body of our college, Sri Mukul Sunawala ji, to address this virtual conference. 
Good morning to all. Respect, uh, respected keynote professor, Dr. A.B. Pandit, Honorable Vice Chancellor, IC, I, I, IC, ICT Mumbai, Principal of our college, Dr. S.V. Rathod, members of the um, organizing committee of the IQAC, national and international delegates and scholars. It is indeed a pleasure to welcome you all for a three-day international conference, conference, conference of fundamental and applied sciences organized by the science department of IQAC of Bhavan's College, Chopati, Mumbai. I am being given to understand that we have delegates from across the globe as resources persons and participants in this conference. I assure, I am sure that the deliberations of the conference will be fruitful to all the participants. I am happy to share you that under the leadership of Principal Dr. Professor S. V. Rathod, our IQAC team has organized more than 20 web seminars and at the national and international level of various stakeholders of various themes during the period of lockdown. We have recently organized a faculty de development program in collaboration with the RUSA, which, which, received, which research received an overwhelming response. Organization of the international conference is, more, is one more feather in the cap of our college. I hope that our team continues to carry on the such academic activities and I wish you all the participants the very best in the future endeavors. Thank you to all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your encouraging words and sharing your value with us. Anytime, sir. anytime, anytime. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. May I now request our principal, Professor Dr. S. V. Rathod, to deliver the concept note. Uh, thank you, Rupa, madam. Uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, respected Professor Dr. A. B. Pandit, okay. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Institute of Chemical Technology, Mumbai, Sri uh, Mukul Sonawala Ji, Trustee, Bharti Vidya Bhavan, and chairman of governing body, Bhavan Sazarimal Somani College, Chaupati, speakers at the plenary session, national and international delegates, and teaching fraternity from various college and university across the globe. As the principals of our college and Bhavan Yed, I pay my humble homage to Kulapati Dr. K. M. Munshi Ji, founder of Bharti Vidya Bhavan and Principal Professor S. M. Parekh, ex-principal of Bhavan Sadarimal Somani College and joint director education Bharti Vidya Bhavan. Let us all convey our gratefulness to Sri Kundarlal Ji Mehta, President Bharti Vidya Bhavan. Sri Dasturji, Executive Secretary, Bharti Vidya Bhavan, and Sri Mukul Sonawala, sir, who is already present for, the, uh, for giving the blessing in this uh, uh, international conference, for their constant support and encouragement for undertaking such academic activities at our college. This international conference on the fundamental and applied sciences is a federated organization dedicated to bringing together a significant number of diverse scholarly events for presentations within the conference program. Events will run over a span of time during the conference, depending on the number and length of presentation. With its high quality, it provides an exceptional value for students, academicians, and industry research. The conference aimed to bring together leading academicians, scientists, 
and research scholars sorry so i hope uh, this uh, conference is uh, definitely uh, uh, useful for all the delegates and the uh, uh, scholars it also provides a primary interdisciplinary platform for the researchers practitioners and educators to present and discuss the most recent innovations trends and concerns as well as the practical challenges encountered and solutions adopted in the field of fundamental and applied sciences i hope all the delegates and participants will be definitely benefited from the deliberations of this international conference all my best wishes to all of you thank you thank you sir for those motivating words and sharing your valuable insights by now request our qac coordinator dr manjusha patwardhan to introduce the keynote speaker honorable professor dr ab pandit vice chancellor of institute of chemical technology mumbai thank you ma'am ma yeah thank you ma'am Uh, it is indeed my proud privilege to introduce professor aniruddha pandit uh, to this international conference as the keynote speaker professor aniruddha pandit acquired his btech degree from indian institute of technology banaras hindu university in 1980 and earned his phd degree from university department of chemical technology udct now known as iit in 1984 from 1984 till 1990 Dr Pandit worked in the Department of Chemical Engineering University of Cambridge United Kingdom as a research assistant and then as a research associate with Professor J F Davidson working in the area of bubble breakup and design of multiphase reactors he developed many novel designs of gas liquid contractors and also developed new impeller designs after returning to India in 1990 He joined ICT as a UGC Research Scientist B, and was subsequently promoted to Scientist C Professor Grade in 1996. Professor Pandit took over the charge as the Vice Chancellor of the ICT on November 29, 2019. He is on the editorial board of five international journals and is an associated editor of Ultrasonic Sonochemistry. He has successfully guided and completed. international science collaborations with universities from france australia and the netherlands he is also on the project appraisal and evaluation committees of the dst and ugc government of india he is currently serving as a member of bog of the iit mumbai he has been an active industrial consultant to many national and international industries Dr Pandit is a recipient of various national and international awards like ISTE National Award for Outstanding Research IICHE Hardilia Award for Excellence in Basic Research Distinguished Alumnus Award Institute of Technology Banaras Hindu University INSA Best Teacher Award to name a few Professor Pandit has more than 300 national and international publications and 16 patents to his credit He has guided 68 masters and 50 PhD students. His areas of interest are physical and chemical processing applications of cavitation phenomena, sonochemistry, ballast water treatment, mixing in mechanically agitated contractors, experimental and CFD investigations, and so on. Sir, we are indeed grateful to have you amongst us. Uh, recently professor pandit has been given an additional charge as the vice chancellor of dr baba saheb ambedkar technological university it is indeed a great moment for all of us to welcome professor pandit amongst us uh, before we begin the keynote address a small announcement for the participants participants are requested to put their questions in the chat box which will be taken up later in the question answer session thank you
Now I request Professor Aniruddha Pandit to deliver his keynote address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Manisha Patrulan, for your kind introduction. And I have been listening very carefully about the theme and the way Dr. Rathod explained the theme. In fact, uh, my talk, which I'm going to deliver today, uh, fits in with this particular theme precisely. I will be talking about the fundamentals and applied sciences. And uh, basically what I'm going to talk about is the various kinds of transformations which we encounter in life, in our uh, general living, including uh, the transformations which we carry out in kitchen, where a simple uh, rice is getting converted into biryani or a pulao. It's a kind of a transformation which you are talking about. So there are different types of transformations. There are transformations which we call physical transformations. Then there are transformations which are chemical transformations. Then there are transformations which are biological transformation, which is simply um, milk converted into curd. It's a biological transformation which is being carried out. Now, as you all understand that every transformation is associated with either the supply or removal of energy. Without the energy, the transformations will not occur. Now, if you want to convert water into steam, which is a physical transformation, you need to supply energy to convert that water into steam. Similarly, if you want to carry out uh, any chemical transformation where chemical reactions need to be carried out, depending upon whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic, you either need to supply energy or remove energy depending upon the case, what, whatever may be. And biological transformation also, you all know that uh, even in, in uh, converting milk into curd, you need to maintain a specific temperature. If it is too cold, then the transformation doesn't occur. If it is too hot, then again, the culture doesn't work perfectly. So every transformation is, is associated with the energy. So let me now start sharing my screen. Let's see. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Let me go to full slideshow. Yeah. Full screen is okay, no? Yes, so sir. What, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. So what, see, my talk is quite long, but I'm not necessarily going to dwell upon each and every aspect. Whatever is of your interest, you can stop me in the middle or we can discuss it in due course of time. The title says gravitationally induced transformations. Now the transformations require supply or removal of energy, as I said, and different ways of supplying energy. Sometimes the transformations are carried out by supplying heat energy. Sometimes the transformations are carried out by using uh, electrical energy. Sometimes the transformations are carried out using microwave. Sometimes the transformations are carried out using radio waves. Now here, I'm going to talk about the transformation which can be carried out by using sound. Right? When I'm saying something, when I'm trying to tell you something, there is a chemical transformation which is occurring. I'm actually saying something. Whatever I say, I'm converting the pressure energy into a sound energy. That sound energy is hitting on your... Um, eardrums, that eardrums vibrations are reaching your brain. Your brain is processing it. Some chemical changes are taking place, which will result into a transformation and understanding what I am saying. So this is also a kind of transformation. So every transformation is a unique in any way. And what we need to understand as depending upon the type of energetic requirement, that means what levels of energy need to be supplied or removed, the transformation can be carried out most efficiently. So let me go on. And this is basically a, a big talk, but I'm going to talk about, fun, since it is a uh, seminar or a conference on fundamentals and applied science, I'm going to touch upon the fundamentals of cavitation phenomena and also going to talk about how this cavitation phenomena, which is essentially a transformation of sound energy into energy supply mode, uh, can be utilized for carrying out various transformations. And we will talk about this uh, in due course. 
Uh, cavitation uh, in earlier days was looked upon as a nuisance. It's basically an engineering phenomena. What tends to happen is uh, the cavities, when they get generated and when they collapse, they generate extremely high temperatures and pressures. And how high the temperatures and pressures are, we will come to that in a minute. But till about 1960s or so, this was always looked upon as a destructive phenomena. It's like uh, you have a nuclear energy. Now, nuclear energy can also be utilized for using a nuclear bomb. But at the same time, nuclear energy can also be utilized for, for generating electricity. So similarly, when cavitation was looked upon as a destructive phenomena, only in 1960s, people started looking at it. Is this so much dissipation of energy? huge amount of energy which is being dissipated, can this energy be harnessed? Can this energy be recovered and be utilized effectively to carrying out the type of transformations which we carry, which we want to carry out? One. Second, can these phenomena be exploited from an engineering angle and we can carry out these transformations much more energy efficiently? Now, energy efficiency is extremely important from a sustainability point of view. You cannot be uh, keep on using because uh, the only inexhaustible source of energy which is available to you is solar energy. Other than that, all the other forms of energy are non-renewable. Uh, to a certain extent, only renewable sources are the biomass related, but they again depend upon the so incident solar energy which we are talking about. So only in 60s and 70s, people started looking at this cavitation phenomena as a means of delivering energy and whether this energy could be effectively utilized for carrying out transformation. Now, I want you to have a look at this small video. Now, this is a video of a nature, a natural entity called snapping shrimp. Now, what snapping shrimp does is snapping shrimp also generates cavitating conditions. Uh, those who have a bit of an understanding of fluid mechanics, uh, you can understand that there is a relationship between velocity and pressure. Because any amount of energy can be broken up in the, in the form of potential energy and kinetic energy. And energy, since it is conserved, if one reduces, other has to increase. So similarly, if kinetic energy increases, pressure energy or potential energy has to go down. If pressure energy increases, the kinetic energy has to go down. So this snapping shrimp, what it does, it essentially creates a cavitating condition. And you can see on the right hand one, this is a film which has been shot at a speed of 20,000 frames per second. So you can imagine in reality, this is happening so fast that it's like a bomb which is thrown by this snapping shrimp towards prey. It's like you are walking along and somebody throws an atom bomb during the Diwali period and the atom bomb comes to next to your ear and suddenly bursts, you are going to get disoriented because of this impact, because of this shockwave which is going to get generated. And you are going to get disoriented. So the same thing which this uh, snapping shrink does, what it does, it, it throws this. And then when the cavity collapses, it generates a shockwave. And this shockwave paralyzes the prey. And then this snapping shrimp goes and eats in peace. On the left hand side, if you observe very carefully, when the actual phenomena happens, that is the cavity collapses, you will find that there is a flash of light. Now, the light gets generated only when the transformation occurs at extremely high temperature. That means the conditions which are generated during this particular cavity are also very high for it to generate light. And we will talk about this in terms of uh, quantification as an engineer, it is absolutely essential for you to, to uh, assess it in the form of uh, mathematical expressions, solve these mathematical expressions, because that is where the fundamental science, which is concept, is converted into applied science. In reality, there is no difference between applied fundamental science and applied science. As we develop more and more understanding of the fundamental science, the science becomes applied in nature. We start exploiting the fundamental science for applications and then it becomes an applied science. So whatever is fundamental today is going to be tomorrow's applied science for sure. This is just a uh, demonstration where they actually measured it 
using a high speed photograph and put a hydrophone hydrophone is a pressure measuring device and you find that during the collapse of the cavity you get a pressure peak and this is what they measured they analyzed it now this gives us a certain clue as you all understand nature is one entity which doesn't waste any resources it has all the time in the world right it is not in a tearing hurry like we we human beings are we want to finish everything uh, overnight but nature has all the time in the world as a result of which it uses all the resources most optimally so can we learn something from this now this particular phenomena of replicating nature or duplicating nature is also called as biomimicry we learn from nature and then transform that in the form of an engineering application and then try to carry out different types of uh, uh, transformations which we are interested in carrying out so once nature has accepted it that means it has a credibility that there are certain applications where this will definitely be most optimal and can be in a sustainable way so the issue there is imagine wherever the location of transformation is the energy needs to be supplied at that location you can't be shouting in one corner and expect something to happen in the other corner right for you to be able to listen to me from any location either you require this device or if you are giving a lecture in the class uh, sometimes the back benchers will complain sir we can't listen to you madam we can't listen to you uh, please speak up loudly so that means the transformation which he, you you are expecting in their brain cannot reach them and that's why it is better to distribute this energy and where the transformation is required now at the same time when you are shouting uh, at the top of your voice for a class of 150 at same time you expend more energy but at the same time if you are having a class of 10 or 11 you need not expend that much energy so depending upon the way the transformation needs to be carried out the location where that energy needs to be supplied or needs to be dissipated is extremely important now what it can do is it can reduce order of magnitude of the energy requirement and that is how the whole process becomes sustainable this is what the actual phenomena of cavitation is it starts with the nuclei it grows to you have an expansion phase so the pressure fluctuating field which i have shown here is a typical sound field sound field is consisting of a, a compression cycle and a rarefaction cycle a bit of physics here a compression cycle uh, is followed by a rarefaction cycle now during the rarefaction cycle because the pressure is reducing if the pressure reduces and becomes equal to the vapor pressure of the medium spontaneous vapor vaporization is going to take place now this is compression cycle and this compression cycle will result into a collapse of the cavity that means all the energy which it has acquired all these energies is dissipated in a very very short duration it's like you are taking a balloon you are blowing up this particular balloon and then putting a needle into that particular balloon and you will find that you get a blast of air pressure energy you get a sound sound energy and sometimes if the temperatures are very high you also get light now this is exactly what this cavitation phenomena is so this can be carried out by using multiple ways now i'm sure in in your lab you would have ultrasonic cleaning apparatus for cleaning of uh, glassware or cleaning up of small instruments uh, you put it in the soil in a bucket and then you put it in also sonic or sometimes those who have gone to visit the uh, jewelers they would find that they will clean the jewelry by putting it in ultrasound and effectively uh, it does clean by performing this cavitation phenomena and i'll explain it to you in a minute so you can generate cavitating conditions by using two means one is acoustic cavitation where you use ultrasound ultrasound is that frequency which you and me cannot hear however dogs do hear that so when the frequency of sound is more than 20 kilohertz it is called as an ultrasound those who have observed a simple boiling of water in a kitchen uh, you would you would find it that if you take water and you start put it on a gas burner you start heating up the water initially you start seeing small bubbles appearing on the surface of the hot uh, surface which is being heated 
and then you start listening if you are very careful you can listen to this particular sound tick 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 these bubbles are actually bursting as a result of which it is creating that sound which you can hear as the temperature increases then the tick 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 becomes tok 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 bubble size increases and when it is near boiling you find that the sound becomes blob 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 it's like a boiling phenomena what it tells you as a physics uh, student you will find that the size of oscillation of the bubble is inversely proportional to its frequency smaller the size higher the frequency lower is the frequency so these are the principles which are fundamental principles which we need to exploit by carrying out uh, these cavitation phenomena alternatively you can carry out cavitation or uh, generate cavitation using uh, hydrodynamic cavitation when you are pumping a liquid and you throttle the valve cross sectional area goes down energy has to be conserved so the velocity increases velocity increases pressure goes down and reduction in the pressure if it becomes equal to the vapor pressure of the media which is being pumped you will find that it will generate cavitating conditions as these cavities travel further downstream they collapse exactly the same way as if it happens in the case of a compression cycle in the case of uh, acoustic cavitation so can this phenomena be utilized effectively and how do we start using this phenomena phenomena now the only way we can utilize this particular phenomena is if we understand the phenomena and that understanding is not enough in terms of lot of hand waving exercise we need to put that in the form of mathematics you need to put it in the form of mathematical expression solve these mathematical equations which will allow you to find solutions which will allow you to decide whether this phenomena can be exploited for for the purposes of uh, transformation which you are carrying out so this is the kind of a work which have been doing uh, uh, me and my group has been doing for the past uh, maybe 25 30 years now and what you see i try to represent it in the form of a cavitational tree there are people who work under the ground that is they are preparing the fundamentals so it's like the roots of the cavitation tree which are being fed with the fundamental science the tree takes up this fundamental science those are the applied sciences so as you can see from here chemical effects physical effects radi radical generation uh, cavitation with a nucleation model cavity dynamics model all these are fundamental understanding of the cavitation phenomena which results into applied sciences as emulsification microbial cell disruption um transport chemical reactions and i will keep on dwelling upon this one by one uh, very quickly not necessarily anybody who is interested in detail i will share this trans uh, share this uh, presentation with uh, with you all you can you can uh, circulate it to all right so let's start with a simple mathematical analysis i am not going to bore you with mathematical expressions but fundamental uh, understanding is absolutely essential so what you have is first a nuclear gets formed so you have to understand how the nucleation phenomena generates now nucleation phenomena i am sure you must have studied it in the, in the school that if you have a dirty glass and you pour a soda water or a beer in it it forms much more and if you have a clean glass it doesn't uh, form that much now that is because dirty glass has got a lot of discontinuities in the liquid medium which provides the nuclei which results into a formation of lot of uh, secondary bubbles it's like so cavitation phenomena nucleation phenomena which happens so there are nucleation theories which we need to understand which have been proposed and which have been validated so what we do what we did here is imagine you have a water molecule where are six water molecules are located in six corners of the cube and when all these six water molecules move away simultaneously a vacuum or a cavity gets generated and we can estimate what is going to be the size of this particular cavity and this size of the cavity uh, uh, will decide, you will be able to calculate and you will be able to estimate what is going to be the size of this cavity of course this pulling away of these eight corners of the cube will also require energy now there are different forms in which this energy is supplied either in the form of sound or in the form of uh, liquid velocity that is a kinetic energy and ultimately it happens in such a way that a cavity gets generated right so this is basically a thermodynamics which you need to understand which you need to convert it into find out uh, while finding out 
what is the essential requirement to for the onset of nucleation now this nucleation you can calculate estimate it and you can calculate the initial size of the nuclei works out to be 8.88 nanometers so the cavity starts with 8.88 nanometers it continues to grow and it grows up to 300 to 400 micron and then it subsequently collapses how does this phenomena of collapse occurs now again you require and you need to resort it to mathematical expressions and this is what is called as rate controlling step now this rate controlling step is the actual transformational step in the form of mathematical expression which allows you to do the energy balance what energy in what form needs to be supplied for the nuclei to get formed the nuclear to grow and then the grown uh, cavity to collapse uh, these are the different models which you can use did not elaborate on that so you start with now the nuclear is formed now nuclear has grown and then you have and you have to understand the dynamics of the model right imagine you have this cavity and the cavity now experiences a compression cycle so the the cavity starts compressing and the cavity compresses its size reduces that means it creates a vacant space surrounding this particular cavity. Now the liquid will start rushing from all the directions to fill up this particular space because the cavity has occurred in, in a liquid continuum. Now liquid has is thousand times more dense than that of vapor or air. As a result of which, it has a lot of momentum associated with it. Now this momentum will keep on compressing this particular cavity and this collapse of the cavity results into these are all mathematical expressions which you can easily solve not very difficult but they are second order equations so you need to have sometimes numerical or analytical schemes are not always possible now these are different ways in which what are the forces which are responsible to control the dynamics of the bubble there are inertial terms there's a pressure inside the bubble there are viscous forces surface tension forces all the force balance which needs to be taken into account to get the solution to this second order equation. Now, second order equation is like you take a quadratic equation, you always get two roots, plus and minus, correct? So you don't know which is correct and which is not correct. But then you understand, you use your own judgment to decide that this must be the correct solution. Similarly, quadratic differential equation will also allow you to have multiple roots, and these roots will, will essentially decide the different types of dynamical behavior of the cavity which you see so either you find that the cavity just compressing expanding compressing expanding compressing expanding and eventually it dissolves again alternatively a cavity grows once and then it collapses in one go that is all the energy which it has acquired let's say from 8.8 .8 nanometers to 250 micron all the energy which is acquired is like released in a bank and released with extremely high temperatures and pressures and come to that in a minute. Alternatively, you can see this. Uh, see, I don't know whether it will work or not. Anyway, this is again a photograph, uh, a video which was taken, uh, which again shows exactly how this is, this is occurring. That is how the cavity grows and how the cavity collapses. Alternatively, cavity oscillates in multiple fashion. It collapses, rebounds again, collapses, rebounds again. It generating multiple oscillations. Now it's like this: is rather than having only one uh, delivered form of energy, I can keep on tapping it. Right? Multiple tappings and a cumulative amount of energy remains the same. This is a different way. I go to a cobbler and I want to put a nail in my uh, in my uh, chapels. And what cobbler will do, initially will tap small to get the position of the nail and then hammer it. So similarly, by controlling the dynamics of the cavity, you will be able to deliver the required quantum of energy in a different way, in a different form. Now here you see how the behavior occurs. This is what is mathematically predicted. And on the right hand side, what you see is the actual photograph behavior. So it tells you that the mathematically correct expressions have been obtained and it tells you the dynamics of the cavity correctly. Every dynamics of the cavity, every oscillation of the cavity is associated with the pressure and temperature pulse 
and this is what you will utilize it for this is what you will utilize it for carrying out transformation so what sort of transformations which we are carrying out now look at the kind of temperatures which are generated inside the cavity you can see this temperature 2500 kelvin now this is for one particular case but as far as the research and measurements are concerned people have reported temperatures inside the cavity of the order of 12000 kelvin surface temperature of sun is 7000 kelvin so it is more than the surface temperature of the sun the conditions for which it generated is is very very short duration it's picosecond so sometimes it is possible for you to utilize this information to carry out a transformation which is likely to happen very fast if not then you'll have to have multiple oscillations which are which are responsible for carrying out this transformation right you can also solve these mathematical expressions again as i said this is all fundamental and i'll move to uh, applications uh, in next uh, for for the next 10 minutes or so before i stop so look at these cavity phenomena cavitation phenomena so there are two phenomena which is a symmetric collapse and asymmetric collapse symmetric collapse means the cavity is suspended in a free medium where the it collapses symmetrically that means it compresses in the radially inward directions from all the directions at an equal rate and this generates temperatures of the order of 5000 to 10000 kelvin pressures of the order of 100 to 1000 to 2000 atmosphere and when you take water vapor and raise the temperature to 3000 kelvin in fact more than 2300 kelvin water dissociates in the form of h and oh ions h2o dissociates in the form of h and oh ions now oh ions those from the chemistry background will understand and will accept they are extremely strong oxidizing agents now if you are able to generate these uh, oh radicals then these oh radicals can be effectively utilized for oxidation mineralizations of many of the products uh, many of the reactants which are likely to be in the vicinity of such collapsing cavities alternatively if the cavity is collapsing asymmetrically that means it is on the surface right so liquid can keep rushing from all the other direction except the bottom as a result of which the cavity collapses asymmetrically now this asymmetric collapse of the cavity results into a formation of liquid jet with velocities 200 to 300 meters per second and these are called as essentially a jet cutting action which is carried out by cavitation and those are the figures which you uh, the photographs which i showed you earlier the erosion of the metal which occurred is as a result of this asymmetric collapse of the cavity this cavity as a micro reactor a few micro 100 microns or 500 micron size imagine this is a cavity which contains water vapor nitrogen uh, argon oxygen these are typical gases which are dissolved in, in water now when this cavity, multiple reactions are likely to take place and these reactions can be now modeled these mod reactions these are the different types of reactions which can occur 45 different reactions are possible for each of these reaction rate constants are available in the literature you can solve all these 45 equations simultaneously and predict what sort of conversions which are going to take place so you have a forward reaction backward reaction mainly because many of these reactions are equilibrium limited reactions so they don't necessarily move in one direction but they can continue to move um back and forth and reach some equilibrium concentration now here you see how the concentration of different species which are getting generated as a result of those 45 reactions which i had talked to you about right till the collapse of the cavity you don't see any change and as soon as the cavity collapses you see a sudden increase in the in the species oh radicals are there then you have uh, nitrogen oxides which are being generated all these species are getting generated as a result of these extreme conditions of temperature and pressures generated inside the cavity so these are the possibilities which we talk about for and these are of course those who are from a chemistry background physical chemistry background will understand how a feasibility of the reaction is is judged on the basis of gibbs free energy if the gibbs free energy is negative then everybody knows that the reaction is feasible you can write down what reactions are feasible and what not 
uh, depending upon the different 45 reactions which we talked about right so these are the different types of reactions and the temperatures at which they are likely to occur 3878 h2o converted into oh then 14000 may may not occur then 7000 kelvin again nitrogen uh, dissociation takes place now we start exploiting this particular phenomena for certain applications right now what are the applications which i am going to talk about see sometimes you will find that um, when you use a surfactant or a soap you will find that after some time all the soap uh, essentially comes to the surface right this is what is called as a surface excess essentially because there are molecules which like air and there are molecules like water and the surfactant has bought both these components hydrophobic and hydrophilic hydrophilic component will remain in water well as hydrophobic component will start looking for air and it will start getting accumulated on the surface and you will find that if you skim the surface you will be able to recover most of the surfactant and that is exactly what is used for recycling of the surfactant so surface phenomena can be utilized now this surface phenomena can be exploited essentially to carry out separation which otherwise would not have been possible you just expose it to cavitating conditions you can find out they are going to diffuse into it because of the hydrophobic nature of the of the entity chemical entity and this nature of hydrophobicity you can effectively utilize for an application of separation phenomena so this is one application of cavitation where you can carry out a separation of a molecule from a mixture uh, or from a solution as long as it has a certain difference or it has a certain um, property where hydrophobic nature and hydrophilic nature are both combined in in an entity this is just again a thermodynamic balance which is required another application which has been utilized and which has been used is for carrying out ultrasonic optimization now this is also a spray gun you might have seen the spray painters which are doing it their air is utilized for uh, atomization but you can have a vibration which is ultrasonic vibration which i took you about it tends to develop capillary waves these capillary waves uh, emerge at the top and then break at the top and you find the droplets which are getting generated their amplitude increases and you'll find that the droplets are getting generated this is again a numerical simulation which has been carried out which can be carried out using uh, uh, computational fluid dynamics type of studies and i would mention that all of these can be utilized can be put to use so you understand physics you understand mathematics to put that physics in the form of mathematical expression you solve those mathematical expressions to understand the possible application and then you use applied sciences and the expressions which will allow you to predict what is likely to happen in due course of time these are the typical uh, photographs which i have taken depending upon how the ultrasonic optimization takes place phenomena is exactly the same of capillary wave formation and capillary wave formation resulting into uh, uh, ultrasonic optimization acoustic streaming again cfd modeling you find that those you have used ultrasonic devices you find how the pressure field varies and it's sort of pulsating it and this pulsating generates a certain uh, movement of the air a movement of the liquid and this liquid movement is called as acoustic streaming i'm not sure whether this is possible you can actually generate this and you can see this uh, movement and how the simulations indicate uh, how it is happening right so forget about all this so i think i'm going to conclude by I would like to stop and i have few more slides and if i have time i'll say otherwise as an engineer what is required of us is to be able to have a control over that phenomena of cavitation manipulate the phenomena of cavitation and use its uh, effect in a positive way the kind of transformations which we are interested in carrying out uh, just to summarize that these are the different applications which we have explored emulsification cell disruption grinding medical nanoparticle synthesis uh, crystallization let me see some one uh, thing i think it will be extremely useful and interesting for you to 
those who would have heard about uh, lithotripsy right so this is what cavity oscillation occurs uh, results into so imagine you have a microbe imagine you have a pathogen in water now this pathogen will get disrupted and you can purify water you can kill these microbes using ultrasonic cavitation or acoustic cavitation now if sufficient amount of energy is delivered the microbe is going to get disrupted and this disruption of the microbes will result into um, rend rendering that microbe unviable effectively uh, purifying the water you can continue to do this in terms of developing various correlations because engineers do rely on development of correlation so this is show you these are again chemical reactions which have been exploited for these for uh, using cavitation so i talked about physical phenomena emulsification um, now i have uh, talked about biological phenomena and this is again a phenomena which is related to a uh, chemistry right there are medical applications as well so these are various chemical reactions which have been successfully carried out which you can carry out in apparatic predicted let's see yeah lithotripsy you have a kidney stone and what happens is imagine this is a kidney stone which is being bombarded by cavitation phenomena and what you see happens to that kidney stone now that kidney stone is getting broken up in the smaller and smaller passages uh, particles and these particles when they become reasonably small they can pass through the urinary tract otherwise it would have been necessary for you to carry out an operation to remove kidney stone so this is lithotripsy which you can carry out the cluster of, of cavities will keep on breaking into small bits uh, and the kidney stone can be destroyed this is now a regular practice which is which is followed or you can also break it in the form of a shock wave and exactly the same way happens in here sometimes these uh, systems work or sometimes don't but it's essentially the same phenomena which is happening out here this is also used for drug delivery in case of cancer treatment um, when the cavity collapses it generates extremely highly reactive free radicals the cancerous cells in the vicinity of the cavity gets completely mutilated completely destroyed as a result of which you can get a clean area and here red part are dead cells and the green part is the cells which have received the drug which is necessary for them to get destroyed so you can use cavitation phenomena coupled with drug so that you can reduce the extent of drug requirement to bring about the same efficacy as far as cancer treatment is concerned point which i am trying to make out here is cavitation phenomena is a phenomena which needs to be understood which needs to be uh, exploited and there are huge opportunities available to you for doing this so i would just stop here and also nanoparticle synthesis are there so forget about it right i'll stop here i think uh, if you have any queries questions i'll be more than happy to answer it pandit sir it was excellent talk thank you you may or may not be aware of the fact that i did my whole phd in sonochemistry in israel with professor gedanken i know <laughs> so shiva I... was there at that time shiva kumar m shiva kumar was there the, who worked as a postdoc with professor gedanken i know professor That's... gedanken very well very good uh, i think shiva kumar is also uh, is on the editorial board of ultrasonic uh, sonochemistry so... yes He is in Nottingham now. That is true. Yeah. So, <clears throat> question for you is: um, when we are fabricating those bubbles and we call it as micro jets that are fabricated with very high pressure and temperature, mm. what is the gas inside the bubble? Okay. Uh, you can control the extent of gas inside the bubble depending upon the solubility of the gas in the liquid medium which you use so if the solubility of the gas can be manipulated then the bubbles which are going to get formed will have a vapor 
of the medium as well as dissolved gases inside it. Now, if the gases are non-condensable gases, then you will find a different behavior because what tends to happen is when the bubble compresses, the condensable gases will condense, but the non-condensable gases will keep on getting compressed and will start exerting a reverse pressure. Now, once the pressure increases beyond a certain value, it cannot be um, sustained in terms of a compression. So the bubble rebounds. Now, rebound again means you are creating a pressure drive, reverse pressure driving force. So some more gases will uh, enter it. And then eventually you may have a complete degassing effect. I've done significant amount of work on degassing as well. But you can control it. And in fact, we haven't tried experimentally. But theoretically, we have tried out by manipulating nitrogen hydrogen concentration in 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 water in such a way that it has that n is uh, 1 is to 3 ratio inside the cavity and you are in a position to synthesize ammonia inside the cavity because ammonia formation takes place significantly higher temperatures and pressures and such temperatures and pressures are generated inside a collapsing cavity so as long as you have a concentration in the proportion in which it is required for the reaction to carry out, you can carry out these reactions. But what is the place where... So again, you are talking about the dissolved gas in water. If it is uh, water itself, then maybe there is dissolved oxygen. That is the way the fish are breathing. Yeah. But, but if you... Take a distilled water and put it in an inert atmosphere on the top of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. What is the gas we should expect in the bubble? See, as long as you have uh, any liquid and you have any atmosphere, gaseous atmosphere, depending upon the solubility and pressure, the pressure solubility are directly proportional. Higher the pressure, higher is the, going to be the solubility. So if the liquid is saturated with that particular gas and if you expose it to cavitating conditions definitely the gas will contain i mean the cavity will contain that gas which is dissolved in it but it will also contain a small quantity of vapor it cannot be because whatever air which is going to come out or nitrogen which is going to come out that nitrogen is going to be saturated with water vapor is like when you are bubbling air uh, bubbling nitrogen through uh, water and the nitrogen comes out from the top, but that nitrogen is saturated with water vapor. So you always have a mixture of condensable and non-condensable gases. And you need to understand, and that's the reason, uh, the, the, what you say is the sequence and the logic which we have developed to carry out specific chemical reactions. You need to understand what are going to be the composition of that particular cavity in terms of its gaseous, gaseous content so that then you can um, predict what are going to be the likely reactions which are likely to happen. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Pandit, for your valuable insights and setting the tone for this uh, international mm -hmm. conference with this very exhaustive keynote uh, address and you very effectively shed light on the various kinds of transformation which we experience in our day-to-day -day life. Any kind of fundamental science when used in day-to-day -day life uh, becomes applied. So your focus on this uh, transformation of energy and some of the cavitational concerns, the way cavitation is uh, produced and the way this energy is to be harnessed uh, it was a thoroughly informative uh, session and I'm sure Thank it you. was a rewarding experience for all the delegates and participants. Um, Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. May I now request our co-convener, uh, Mr. Swapnil uh, Shivale, to moderate uh, any question and answers if there are any questions in the chat. Madam. Thank you, madam. Uh, so there are uh, two questions and the questions are related to the medical field. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is, can cavitation phenomena be used to remove the cellular debris or fatty substances in obese or diabetic patients? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the only thing is you need to have a control over the cavitation phenomena. See, uh, cavitation essentially is a stochastic phenomena. It's a random phenomena. Uh, that means you can... 
have some control but you can never have it to go for ultrasound uh, ultrasound testing for a pregnant woman they are not recommended to do it very very frequently because there is every chance that even if a small cavitation occurs during the treatment the fetus may get damaged so that it is absolute and that's why we use extremely high frequencies we use frequencies in the megahertz region and the power which is used is extremely low just to avoid the chances of cavitation occurring so indeed the cavitation has been utilized for removing tumors cavitation has been utilized for removing um, cholesterol debris inside the <clears throat> arteries as long as you have a control over it the cavitation can be utilized so cavitation has been used to essentially treat the tumors in between this is called as hifu high intensity focused ultrasound where you focus ultrasound at the location of the tumor and you cook the tumor inside inside without having to resort it to any medical treat any operation you treat it externally you cook that particular uh, tumor kill all the cells and then the body will then take care of it by just filtering it out your kidney will take care of all the debris which are getting formed yes sir thank you sir there is one more question yeah uh, it is related to uh, cancer uh, cancer and you had said in your talk that cavitation results in apoptosis uh, yeah so, uh, uh, in the apoptosis uh, other than the target tissue is the mm. other tissue also damaged so if it is not damaged so can cavitation uh, act as a subsidiary and it uh, we can we can use cavitation to overcome uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy? cavitation again i would say because it's a yeah it's a radiation therapy again radiation therapy also see sound is also a form of a radiation it's not an electromagnetic radiation but it is essentially a, a physical radiation right so any radiation as long as you have a control over it you will always find that the damage of the let's say viable or um, uh, what is the word is the the good tissues may also occur but the control damage similarly when you use radiation treatment you usually have a focused area you have uh, what we call as focusing lens you have uh, collimators to collimate the radiations limited to a specific location where the radiation treatment is to be given so high intensity focused ultrasound does precisely that it's essentially a focused ultrasound it's like a it's a concave lens which has a focal point at a specific distance and then you adjust it in such a way that the energy delivery takes place at the focal point now if you adjust it in such a way that only at the focal point where the tumor is located you will be in a position to kill it now if you add certain quantity of drug in it the diffusional increase which happens as a result will enhance the efficacy of the drug as a result of which the quantity of drug which is required is significantly reduced so the side effects can be significantly reduced people have come out with uh, with devices which we call it as uh, prickless injections which are essentially ultrasonic devices you put an ultrasonic on the skin and the skin tissues dilate and you can deliver insulin through that and you don't have to take an insulin injection now there are now devices available uh, in us and even in india now where you can deliver insulin without having to take any injection so all these things are coming up as a result of it in fact uh, if you remember about couple of weeks ago there was an article uh, it's saying that ultrasound has a potential to kill coronavirus correct so that's exactly what i am talking about i mean there are multiple applications you need to exploit it you need to explore it you need to study it and studying with a coronavirus like uh, essentially is a, is a, you require a bsl 3 type of a lab you can't do it openly because it's a highly infectious uh, disease so but in principle it is possible in principle it is definitely possible you can destroy the corona virus because it breaks down it just gets completely dis dismantled thank you sir 
sir the questions have been addressed and i request uh, rupa madam to proceed thank you very much sir and thank you mr shivali for moderating the question and answer session uh, may i now request uh, organizing secretary of this conference dr suraj gajbiye to propose vote of thanks for the inaugural session thank you ma'am aur patron shri mukul sonawala ji trusty bhartiya vidya bhavan mumbai and chairperson of governing body of bhavan sadarimal somani college mumbai keynote speaker professor dr ab pandit honorable vice chancellor institute of chemical technology mumbai respected principal professor dr s v rathod respected speaker of all session organizing committee members head of departments of science stream iqac members and colleagues from college and my dear participants i feel honored and privileged to get the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of bhavans hazarimal somani college mumbai this is a proud moment for all of us at bhavans college that we are hosting this 3 day international conference on fundamentals and applied sciences i express my heartfelt thanks to our patron shri mukul sonawala ji for his blessing and sparing his valuable time for his from his busy schedule to grace this occasion i place on record our deep sense of gratitude to honorable keynote speaker professor dr ab pandit for his keynote address we are really thankful to you sir for sharing your valuable insight your presence has added grandeur to this function i extend my heartfelt gratitude to principal professor dr s v rathod sir for encouraging and guiding us to organize this conference my sincere thanks to all the speaker for various plenary session to make themselves available to attend this inaugural function today and at last but not least i wish to extend my generous thanks to all the participants who have come from around the globe for their participation i truly hope that all of all of us will have an enriching learning experience in the upcoming session thank you once again over to you rupa ma'am thank you dr gajbiye it was indeed an enriching experience we now begin with the plenary session uh, may i request uh, dr urmila maru head department of chemistry to introduce the resource person for the first plenary talk dr vilas pol purdue university usa thank you rupa madam it is indeed my great pleasure to introduce dr pol dr vilas pol is currently the professor and purdue faculty scholar at davidson school of chemical engineering purdue university usa He has completed his doctoral studies from the University of Bar Ilan, Israel, in 2005. He has worked on dye-sensitized solar cells and intense pulse neutron source during his postdoctoral research in Israel and USA. He has also worked as a visiting faculty in the International Center for Material Nano Architectonics, Japan. as a distinguished material scientist he has to his credit about 32 national and international awards 10 patents 88 plus international talks at conferences and workshops 208 articles published in internationally reputed journals including nature scientific reports apart from being the recipient of numerous international awards dr paul also hold the prestigious guinness book of world record in 2018 for the fastest time taken to arrange all elements of the periodic table at an astonishing record time of 8 minutes and 36 seconds it is truly our privilege and pleasure that we have an academician of his repute amongst us today whose profound erudition would add to the rich learning experience i now request dr paul to begin the session over to you sir
Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Sopnil Shewale who invited me here to uh, talk. And actually I'm from Pune, so it is a blessing to go back and talk on Sopati. <laughs> so it's not far from the Pune. So what I'm going to do today is talk about, can you really live without me and that me is a rechargeable battery. As everybody knows that we are 7.7 .7 billion people on this earth currently, and we are holding around 15 billion batteries in our pockets and purses and cell phones and electric vehicles. And this is going to go more and more with time. So what are the things needed in order to develop this science and technology uh, all the way from fundamental to applied? That is what I am going to touch base in this conference talk. So my group here, they are the one uh, who carried out most of the work and I am going to just present on their behalf to all of you. Can all of you see the slides uh, correctly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome. Before the talk, I would like to uh, start uh, with Gayatri Mantra that is said uh, by Maharshi Vishwamitra. Om Bhur Bhuvaswaha Tasya Vithur Varenyam Bargo deva shadhi mahi dhyo dhyo na prachodaya. Now, in this talk, I am going to do a few things. Going to introduce ourselves, what we are, what our team does in the Purdue University campus. Then we will talk about what are the challenges throughout the world we are facing in order to develop better batteries that can be longer lasting, safer, and high energy density. And also we can recycle them uh, effectively. I will also give a few examples to elaborate on what are the current research focus of our lab here at Purdue University. Uh, as you mentioned, to encourage our young generation, I would also uh, show you a slide or two on the Guinness World Record that we set. And I will also pass some take home messages to our young generation and faculties where almost nothing is impossible. You just have to dream it and things will happen when you are going in that direction. So a little bit introduction to Purdue University. Many of you might be aware of this university. Uh, now ICT director Pandit sir uh, gave a nice talk. Actually, uh, I have a student from ICT. His name is Mihit Parekh. Uh, he is a fifth year graduate student in my group now. will be graduating soon. And he is a wonderful student uh, working on uh, developing anode materials for next generation batteries. So giving introduction to Purdue University, you might remember or recall that the first man, uh, Neil Armstrong, who went on moon in Apollo 11 in 1969. And the statement he made is that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. So since then, Purdue created 30, uh, 22 astronauts, uh, they went on moon and uh, various planets and doing very well. Even our Bharat Ratna, uh, Dr. C.N.R. Rao, who graduated from Purdue uh, in chemistry department in 1958, we do have two Nobel Prize winning people in the chemistry department of Purdue. And Professor C.N.R. Rao has very strong ties uh, with University, when he visited us uh, several years ago, 
I was one of the host for him. So it was a uh, pleasure for me to meet him. Uh, he's also a friend of my former uh, professor from Israel, uh, Professor Gedankin. So this is Purdue University in fall season. It's very colorful. Uh, most of the things are red bricked. So the outside, they look all same. So when visitor comes to us, we only show the few buildings and then say that all of them are the same. So you don't have to vis visit each and every building. But all of you are uh, welcome to visit Purdue whenever you have travel plans to US next time. And I will be happy to host you here. Now, what do we do on Purdue campus? In my group, I am the first one to develop an experimental group on Purdue campus. I used to work as a scientist at Argonne National Lab in Chicago before joining here seven years ago. I came with an expertise where one can make the batteries from scratch. You can develop the material, you can develop the electrolyte separator, separator modification. You can put the battery together either in a small fashion or in a larger scale and test them. The batteries could be lithium ion batteries that is sitting in your cell phone and laptops, but our main focus is to develop their safety aspects. More than that, we are trying to develop materials and electrolytes for next generation batteries, that is sodium ion battery, potassium ion batteries, and lithium sulfur batteries. For example, the sodium ion battery is very good for renewable energy storage. That is, if you have the energy from solar and wind generated, you don't need that energy where you generated. So it can be effectively, economically stored in sodium ion and then utilized whenever you need it. Potassium ion battery, potassium is beneath sodium in the periodic table as the S block element. Sodium and potassium are inexpensive and abundant compared to scarcity of lithium in the world. And that is the reason we are studying those next generation batteries. But our group is mainly focusing on finding out whether those potassium ion batteries are safer or not. Whatever materials or electrochemistry we are developing, if the batteries are not safe, there is no point you spend 10 years of R&D and then conclude that those batteries are not safe, we should not use them. So in parallel, when the development is happening, R&D is happening, we are immediately figuring out uh, the safety, thermal safety aspect of the potassium ion battery. And our initial conclusions here are, those batteries could be safer than lithium ion batteries because of the cathode utilized and the anode interaction happening with the potassium. So our initial findings are thus, show that we could make safer batteries than even lithium ion batteries when you use the potassium. As everybody's cell phone try to discharge in the afternoon, we are trying to generate lithium sulfur based batteries where the lithium metal has very high energy density or capacity and sulfur as a cathode has high energy. So when you combine them, you will have a very wonderful battery. You may not need to charge or discharge your cell phone uh, for a few days. So those are the few things happening in my group. We also started working on the solid state batteries where everything is solid. There is no liquid electrolyte, eventually making them uh, safer. So with that, we will start some ideas and thoughts from respected Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And he did mention in many of his talks that how to have a successful career or whatever you want to do, have a success in that. So he fragmented that in the four parts. He said, said that you should set a goal or an object, objective. In order to achieve that aim, you have to continuously acquire the knowledge. I am teaching here in chemical engineering, but my background is chemistry. I never learned any chemical engineering courses before I become a faculty. But really it doesn't matter, you can learn it and then teach it. So if you continuously acquire the knowledge, 
then you are staying on the top of that particular field. There is no alternative to hard work. Whatever you are doing in order to succeed in that particular field, as he was developing Agni and Nag Pinaka missiles for our defense, where I used to work, DRDO Pashan, uh, HEMRL, High Energy Material Research Lab, before going to Israel. Uh, indeed, that taught me uh, you have to work hard, you have to develop things. There is failure many times. And not to be afraid of the failures, you should have a perseverance. And eventually you will be successful to achieve your goal, whatever you would like to do. So the reason I am telling or mentioning that here is we are talking about batteries. And this is very complicated field. And we are trying to figure out how we can navigate in a way that we should solve multiple problems parallelly in order to bring those batteries to us, which is a significant need for all of us, uh, as soon as we could, uh, developing countries and developed countries, everybody needs it. So if you look at this growing market of lithium ion batteries, you will come to know that there are many things related to batteries. Grid energy storage, for example, solar and wind and portable electricity, you have to have the batteries to do that. Not only in US, but everywhere there are electric cars coming and buses and many things are happening that is powered by uh, batteries. Uh, China is uh, taking lead in this case. So they have lots of bikes which are powered with uh, batteries. As you know that consumer electronic has a huge market in order to make the batteries and utilize them. And without them, actually, we cannot be a mobile society. So having more and more batteries is really important for all of us. And we should work together in a way that we can develop a technology or multiple technologies and industries that would help this humanity. Now, since we are all academic folks, immediately we check uh, how many number of papers and patents are filed uh, in the science and technology. If you look at the publications per year, you can see that thousands of papers are published in one year. 65,000 papers are published in one year just on battery-related research and development. And that includes fundamental as well as applied development. There are even thousands of paper, uh, patents are filed. Almost 25,000 patents are filed in uh, 2019. So really, the growth of this field is just expanding. And it is like an outbreak uh, because of the need we have with these batteries, which can make our life much easier than what it is now. So you might know that the cell phone that we had in past, our parents used to use, compared to that, the growth is happening and the way they are growing and becoming smaller and smaller and smarter and smarter, uh, that is also because of the batteries. If the battery is not there, the device doesn't do anything. So batteries are equally important as the device itself, that is your iPhone or whatever uh, phone you have. So batteries are becoming smaller and more powerful and kind of safer. As you can see that initially we had very limited milliamp hour capacity of those batteries, but now we can make much better batteries to power your device that is continuously asking for the energy. You are playing the videos, you are doing multiple tasks, you and you are uh, listening, some of you are listening this meeting on phone, so really you need an energy storage device there. And without that, you will not be able to do it. Now even you can see that more and more applications are coming uh, that includes uh, variable electronics. Uh, people are using smart glasses where you still need a battery. Without that, that glasses doesn't work. You have a smart watch, Apple watch or whatever you are using. Even people are trying to use the shirts where shirt can act as a device where you can either have a, a screen or you can uh, emit the light or you can change the light. Those type of things can happen. Uh, you might have seen our children uh, typically have shoes. There is a small light and 
that light can be also powered by the batteries or the energy can be stored. And when the uh, children are moving, that can be utilized to see that somebody is moving forward. Now, electric vehicle demand is really taking over and becoming overpowering compared to all other uh, technologies. Uh, so lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, commercial electric vehicles and stationary storage and consumer electronics and even buses, it is just going up and up. So 2000 gigawatt uh, energy it can be stored and utilized by 2030 in batteries itself. Uh, Plug-in electric vehicles where you will have the a vehicle powered with electricity that is also continuously growing from 2011 to 2016 and it continues to go up and it doesn't want to stop. We are believing that batteries are making cars safer and greener, but not necessarily that is the reality because nobody understands the full spectrum of the batteries, how the batteries are made, what are the materials required for batteries and how those materials are made, how much CO2 they are releasing. Even the electricity itself, country like India and China, we still make some of the electricity from coal. If you burn the coal, release the CO2 to the atmosphere, get the electricity, put that in the battery and then drive the electric vehicle. Is it making sense for us and really the ecosystem telling us that batteries are better than uh, your gasoline vehicle. So if you have to study everything together, then you will come to conclusion that not necessarily batteries are greener for us. They have their own issues, including once they are retired from your device, nobody knows in the world how to recycle them effectively. So all those problems has to be resolved uh, simultaneously in order to develop this new technology. As we have seen that production is also increasing as the need arises more and more. For example, LG came from South Korea. They are making 50 gigawatt capacity batteries. This is a Chinese company, Cattle and BYD. Uh, they are making variety of batteries in China and most of their vehicles are powered with uh, batteries now. Japanese Panasonic company uh, previously used to provide batteries for Tesla and all other electronics, they are also doing very well. And Tesla has a gigafactory in Nevada uh, in US where they are uh, making tons of batteries in a daily basis and powering many electric vehicles and many other devices. So really there is a growth happening and this growth will continue to happen. Now, what kind of batteries we are talking about? There are two main kinds of batteries, primary batteries and secondary batteries. Today's talk is mainly focused on secondary batteries, which we can charge and discharge as the need arises. The batteries could be coin cell type, or the batteries could be cylindrical type, batteries could be prismatic type, or it is called as pouch cell. So your cell phone has this pouch cell type of battery, which goes and sits behind the electronics on the uh, in the cell phone and based on the size of the battery itself, the cell phone size can be defined and the device can be charged and discharged. Uh, Tesla electric vehicle batteries are made from something like this uh, cylindrical cells where when the car is moving and vibrating, such batteries can take care of the vibration and not to have the current collector coming out or getting separated from the material coated on the uh, current collector itself. You have also seen such batteries which are used for R&D purpose, which can be charged and discharged uh, effectively where anode, cathode, electrolyte, everything can be added. Once this is successful, then we can develop all other kinds of batteries that is required for variety of purposes. Now, what are the challenges we are facing in order to develop better battery science and technology? For example, the cost of the batteries are high, they are not safe. Life is very limited as your cell phone battery uh, dies in three to four years. And battery does not want to work at lower or higher temperature as we are putting the liquid electrolyte that can gasify or it is a flammable at around 70, 80 degrees Celsius, or it can even freeze at uh, minus degree Celsius temperature. 
So in order to solve all those issues, those are all challenges we are facing. And the new challenge we have is we do not know how to recycle those batteries. So we have to consider all those factors together in order to develop the new science and technology for battery. If you just solve one problem and create many more, then the science and technology is not really moving forward, but moving backward. So according to me, if you do not track everything together, then our future could be like this broken glass. So the big perspective you should understand and then start working on the battery science and technology in a way that we can develop something significant. Now to take a motivation from Mahatma Gandhi, he mentioned that if I have the belief that I can do it, I shall surely acquire the capacity to do it, even if I may not have it at the beginning. And it is true, many of us did not know many things. Whatever we are doing it today, because we started somewhere, that time we didn't know, but maybe we know a little bit now, maybe 1% of full science and technology or so. But we have to begin somewhere, the next generation has to begin, and we have to propel them in a way that they are the one to solve the next generation uh, bigger challenges. You might remember that in 2019, uh, there was a 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi's uh, birth. Purdue University also became 150 years old. And you may or may not be aware of the fact that our periodic table, which is the origin of all the science and technology, all those elements are really valuable. The origin of that discovery also started in 1869 and the Russian scientist Mendeleev Dimitri, he was the one to start organizing that periodic table with his limited uh, elements available in Russia. That time there was no internet in 1869, so they couldn't talk to each other or other countries or get any data from anyone. But whatever he had, he was enough smart to keep the gaps between elements and figure out according to the mass, that time he was organizing element based on their atomic masses. Now we are organizing them based on their numbers, uh, slightly different. Uh, but indeed he did a marvelous job. In order to encourage the new generation, not only in US, but throughout the world, I wanted to do something to encourage our younger generation and also celebrate 150th anniversary, I decided to set a Guinness World Record and that did happen on Purdue campus. Uh, and I will show you quickly how did it happen. So this was the setup there. Uh, many people collect, gathered. He is a Mihit Parekh student of ICT, uh, undergrad student doing PhD here. And the idea here was you write the element name on the tiles, two inch by two inches tile, and then mix up those tiles. And you do not have any clue that which element is supposed to be where. And you randomly pick it up and put it in its correct place. And if you misplace it, it takes forever to align them. And if even one element is misplaced, the periodic table is not right. So you cannot set the record. So let's say this video plays or not here. See. Okay, it doesn't want to play, but I will not take your time. There is a YouTube video that you can see how the Guinness World Record is set. Uh, it is available on YouTube. Uh, finally, the record was set on August 15, 2018. Uh, as mentioned before, it took eight minutes and 36 seconds. Uh, just remember our brain is not a supercomputer yet. Although we develop a supercomputer, but our brain doesn't act as a supercomputer. Uh, it really gets hot when there is something random and you ask it to organize in its correct fashion. But you can do with practice and the confidence and understanding of the whole periodic table. You need to know all the elements where are they located? What is the reason? Molecular weight and their neighbors and electronegativity and so forth and so on. 
Now let's talk about the batteries that, how the batteries are working and what can we do? So lithium ion batteries, you go on seeing the positive electrode and negative electrode and they have their own capacity. And based on the capacity, it tells you that how long this battery will work. So currently in your cell phone, there is an anode which is graphite that has very limited capacity and cathode also has a limited capacity. And that is the reason the cell phone go on discharging very rapidly. So during the charge, what happens is this lithium cobalt oxide based cathode gives up these lithium ions through the electrolyte and separator. It goes to the graphite that is the interlayer spacing there. It sits there from the outer circuit, the electrons are going. So you are meeting lithium plus and electron. You are getting lithium metal. That lithium metal reacts and coordinate with six carbon atom to form this alloy and then the battery is charged. And this battery never discharges until you knock out the electron. When you take out the electron to play in the device, the electron go from outer circuit and the lithium goes to its parent molecule. And this is the mechanism lithium ion batteries are working. And every day, the charge and discharge capacity has to be 100%, but there is nothing in the world that is 100% efficient. So the amount of lithium you are sending, 99.9% or 99.99% lithium is coming back and you lose something. And that is the way you are decreasing the capacity of your material almost daily. And eventually your batteries are out of order. You have to throw it away uh, as they decay themselves. So one of the idea here we are going to demonstrate where we were developing the separator in a way that you make a high energy density battery and safer battery just with the modification of existing separator. So in order to discover something new, you should not change everything. You should change one thing at a time and that would lead to something uh, significant. So uh, this paper uh, published in Advanced Energy Material where we took everything standard. The cathode was standard, lithium metal we kept as is. We chose to have a lithium metal instead of graphite, where we have around 3,800 milliamp hour per gram capacity, which is much higher than your graphite, 10 times higher than the graphite. And we decided to shuttle the lithium back and forth uh, through the separator. But traditional separator has a micron size porosity that allows this lithium ion to randomly go back and forth. And that was the reason the lithium grows the dendrite tree-like architecture on the surface. And eventually it can poke through the separator, go to the counter electrode, have the short circuit and battery will be useless or it can catch fire. So to avoid that, we did a simple modification. This is a standard separator. We modified that with a polydopamine based polymer. Only one side of the separator was modified. The total thickness of separator is 25 micron. We kept 20 micron as is, five micron was modified. And we also added a graphene that is a conducting material on the side of the separator on the top of polydopamine, which helped to increase the conductivity, electronic conductivity in the system where you can charge and discharge the battery much rapidly. Even you can use the battery at lower temperature that your current batteries are not working. So again, in the applied side, again, sometimes we develop something, but it is too small. You can never scale it up. We also try to scale it up to make the bigger size uh, pouch cell that can fit in your cell phone or laptop. So you have to uh, develop the separator that is much bigger and eventually assemble those batteries. So we made coin cells and started studying really this new separator is useful or not. What you can see here is this is the traditional separator. Initial capacity was 125 milliamp hour per gram. Within thousand cycles, that is three years of your charge and discharge daily life, you have only 50% capacity left. That means this battery might have total six years of life if you keep the current battery. But if you just use the modified separator, let's say only 10% of the capacity is decreased even up to 1000 cycle. So the life of this battery could be much higher just because of the 
modification of the separate. We have scaled it up, made it a bigger size. We have bigger cathode. We put anode cathode electrolyte separator together and per university battery systems based batteries we developed. And even we powered some of the devices and demonstrated that these batteries are really good. And even they can work at lower temperature. The battery we produced here was working very effectively on the snow at minus 10 degrees Celsius because of the addition of the graphene. I do not know how much time I have. Fifteen more minutes, sir. All right. So we do have time. So you might be thinking that what are we currently doing? What is the current focus of our lab? So as you know that Neil Armstrong uh, went on moon uh, for the first time. We also want to do some exploration maybe not myself or my team members, but maybe our batteries can go and power something that is needed. For example, uh, everybody want to go nowadays on Mars. For Mars exploration, uh, Elon Musk uh, wanted to go and send many people. So in order to do that, what we have to do is to make the energy storing device. You might get some sunlight there, but unless you store that energy, you will not be able to utilize. So they are developing uh, Mars helicopters and many things, but the batteries are needed. And the requirement of this battery is, this battery should work at plus 50 degrees Celsius. Batteries only like to currently work at room temperature. And also the battery should work at minus 120 degrees Celsius. So currently there is no system that can have that wide range open and the electrolyte made that will make the batteries work at that wide temperature. Even for the defense of uh, Navy application for submarines, when there is a ice and snow on the top here, and the submarines are down there, so temperature is really cold there. And they should also have the energy storing device. And that's what a uh, Naval Safe Batteries, our group is developing. And there is also Safe Bat we are developing for the Mars. Now, Saying is enough that we are developing, but does it work? Here you can see the data, uh, initial data that shows that our batteries can work at low temperature as well as high temperature. For example, this is a, a lithium iron phosphate versus lithium based battery. The theoretical capacity of this material is around 160 milliamp hour per gram. At higher temperature, you are getting even higher capacity than the theoretical capacity as the kinetics of the reaction is faster. The lithium is moving much faster back and forth and you are getting slightly higher capacity. This battery also works at room temperature giving the theoretical capacity that is expected. Zero degree Celsius, when the things are colder, it is still working, producing let's say 140 milliamp hour per gram capacity minus 25 degrees Celsius, minus 40 degrees Celsius, and minus 50 degrees Celsius. And we are still getting almost more than half of the capacity. Namely, if we keep the same charging rate, let's say we are charging battery for five hours and trying to discharge. So this is a charge plateau, and this is a discharge plateau. So if you are taking five hours to charge and five hours to discharge, even at lower temperature, batteries are working. They were not working before. And the reason they work, we develop an electrolyte where we chose a solvent from chemical factory that has a freezing point of minus 135 degrees Celsius. But only choosing that was not enough. We had to do many architecture in a way that that electrolyte will have the salt dissolved and eventually the battery will work. So our first attempt shows that batteries are working very well until minus 50 degrees Celsius. Now NASA and Mars wanted to make the batteries work at minus 120 degrees Celsius. Many chemical engineers and scientists and other engineers knows that there is no system on earth that can generate such a low temperature. You can take liquid nitrogen, we have that, but you need to have a system or a furnace or a oven that goes effectively at lower temperature. 
So we are designing one in order to demonstrate for the first time that batteries could work as the lowest temperature as well as highest high temperature without having the thermal runaway. So those kind of things are happening. Now I am slightly changing gears. I'm talking about the solid state batteries. Everybody knows that the lithium ion batteries sitting in your cell phone are not safe because of the liquid electrolyte we are putting inside which is pyrophobic. When the temperature of the battery gets hot, the electrolyte can catch fire because there is inbuilt oxygen inside the battery. Otherwise, battery should not catch fire. Lithium cobalt oxide has its own oxygen. When the material fragments, the oxygen releases, and if it is enough hot, the electrolyte can catch fire. Eventually, the battery can have the gas inside. With the gas pressure, it will uh, leak and then outside oxygen or air can go in and eventually there will be a thermal runaway or catastrophic failure. In this typical case, everything is solid. The lithium metal is solid, the electrolyte is solid, something of this uh, people say in ceramic language, LLZTO. Uh, this has a lithium, lanthanum, zirconium, titanium and oxygen, which is a ceramic material. We put it as a separator and we also have a cathode that is ceramic. Those materials were not working. We had to do some architecture and to make it happen at room temperature. So the problem with our current batteries, they have the uh, flammable electrolyte, they can form lithium dendrites, they can leak. So that was not advisable. Uh, and that is the reason we are developing now solid state batteries and that is the future of all this battery technology. Are those batteries are working? Indeed, those batteries are working fabulously where we took uh, lithium iron phosphate and lithium was the anode material. And when we have the ceramic uh, separator where we did modification with some of the polymers and lithium iron phosphate was the cathode. And when the battery, all solid state battery was together, you can see thousands of or hundreds of stable cycles we can achieve. This is a cycle number as a function of capacity of the battery. This battery also produces very high potential, uh, three to four volt. The more the potential, more the energy density you get. Uh, there are some batteries or materials which has a tendency to die or have the capacity fading happening time to time. And we are also trying to figure out what are the issues and challenges there but solid state batteries that can become flexible electronic uh, supporter and many other things and your clothes and many things. So solid state batteries are the future for everyone and a lot of efforts throughout the world people are putting on it. So we are not only making the small scale batteries and demonstrating, but we can also make the pouch cell uh, where the cathode and separator is really big. Uh, those are in several inches uh, tall and wide and you can make positive negative electrodes and eventually the batteries are working uh, and it is all solid state. You can uh, hammer this battery. You can try to make it fire. It doesn't want to catch fire. If the lithium ion battery is 100% unsafe, this battery is only 30% unsafe. We have studied that uh, using our uh, new technique called as a multimodal colorometry that is very similar to differential scanning colorometry, but that studies in situ uh, battery is safe or not when you are charging and discharging and the same time you are heating it up to higher temperature. Now you do have a trouble and everybody has a trouble in the world what to do with the plastic that we are generating. As you know that plastic has much more life than we have. Polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene can live up to uh, let's say 300-400 years without decomposing and we die in 60 to 70 years itself. But we do not stop producing because they are very easy to utilize. They are very inexpensive. So when I left India and watching this pollution happening everywhere, I was planning to design something that can effectively upcycle. Upcycle means you take something totally valueless and make something valuable out of the raw material or the feedstock. So I designed a reactor where this plastic bag was inserted and closed in argon atmosphere. 
and allow the hydrocarbons, carbon and hydrogen to separate. Once the carbon separates at 700 degrees Celsius from hydrogen, hydrogen remains as a gas and the carbon uh, remains as a liquid crystal. And when you shut down the furnace, it nucleates, you get very nice, beautiful, spherical, solid carbon sphere. It is impossible to make any other process solid and dense carbon spheres, uh, but this process could make it and the reaction time is only one minute. Now here, only thing we need is, it generate the self pressure, because once you pyrolyze the molecule, it generates the, temp uh, at higher temperature, it generates the pressure. So this reaction is high temperature, high pressure. So scalability still remains the issue. Although many companies try to license the technology and scale it up, it is not that easy, but small scale, we can make this material very effectively. This technology won this R&D 100 award. 100 means 100 best technologies in the world in 2015. It was very effective in back in 2011 to make carbon nanotubes out of your waste plastic in this reactor. And you can make it in grams. Just you need a cobalt acetate as you are generating the plasma in this closed reactor. You don't need hydrogen. You don't need any sophisticated equipment. You don't need other catalysts. Just cobalt acetate and plastic bag in a closed reactor could produce bulk carbon nanotubes, multi-wall carbon nanotubes. That was also appeared on NOVA Science, PBS NOVA. I am not sure why these uh, videos are not playing, but those are available on YouTube. You can watch uh, how the carbon nanotubes were produced from waste plastic bags. Now, the battery science is developing, good things are happening. And with that, the cost of the battery technology is decreasing. And that is the beautiful thing we want to see. The cost is decreasing and the science and technology is increasing. Uh, where initial cost was very high in 2010, let's say $1,000 uh, per kilowatt hour. Now it is almost one tenth or one ninth of the cost uh, we can get the batteries because of the significant development happened uh, during last 10 years or 12 years. Now, the question we opened in the beginning that can we live without batteries? And you might have uh, got the answer yourself that batteries are everywhere, correct? In your, all the devices, uh, they are powered with batteries. Uh, whenever the electricity is not needed or when you are sleeping, the batteries can be charged. And next day when you wake up, all those devices are ready to run and you can play or our children can play. So the batteries became really, really important field in the science and technology. And indeed we cannot live without the batteries. This almost became a basic need like internet uh, in addition to food and other things what we need. So with that, the development of those batteries happened during last 30 years. 1991 was the first year when the battery came to the market. And those are the three gentlemen from the world. Two of them are in US. Uh, one of them I invited here on Purdue campus to give a talk uh, in 2017. Uh, because of their discovery, they did it in 1917 and 80s, 70s and 80s. We could see all those batteries in our uh, devices and utilize them effectively today. So what is the take home message from this, can you live without me? So the batteries are telling you cannot and there are many other fields of research. You really need them, many things. It can be food industry, it can be chemical industry. So I would like to give here the take home message that you can do whatever you want, but try to make some impact in that particular field and develop it. And to do that, you have to become strategic. You really have to plan it, execute it, and analyze it time to time. The direction you started, are you going in that direction? If not, then what are the things you need to learn and understand? Um, sometimes we do not know what is our strength. As you know that our brain is such a powerful entity in the body, but we use only 20% uh, of its power and other power we are just keeping it and not really pushing the borders, but we do have significant power in our brain. Everybody has. If we believe ourselves and never give up, you will be able to develop whatever is needed 
not only for India, but for the world or for everyone in this world. With that, I am going to stop here and happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paul. It was indeed uh, an insightful uh, session. Uh, and the question that you raised, can we really live with our batteries? And they are really ubiquitous, I must say. We can't live without them. And even while exploring the various challenges that may crop up, uh, your talk has really given an impetus uh, for acquiring knowledge and marching ahead. Thank you very much for that inspiring uh, plenary talk. Uh, may I now request uh, the convener of uh, the conference, Dr. Sandeep Mind, to kindly moderate the question and answer session, followed by vote of thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rupa, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Paul, sir, for a very informative talk. And he has shown us a, a beautiful Purdue University campus. Uh, one question is there in chat box. Uh, can do electron deficient compound of transition element play the role in forming battery? Yes. The question is. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the can do electron deficient compound of transition element play the role of forming bat battery? This is the question. Yes, sure. I will be happy to answer that. Let's say take a very simple example of cathode that is sitting in your cell phone now. Uh, it is typically lithium cobalt oxide based material. So what happens is this lithium goes from cathode to anode and goes back when you discharge the battery. So typically what happens, this is a one molar here, uh, one mole of lithium, but actually we are never able to take one mole. Otherwise what happens is this is a layered structure material, oxygen layer, cobalt layer, and lithium layer. If you take out the whole lithium from the structure, it will collapse. So actually the material is always deficient. It is not having the full lithium sitting here or the opposite side. So the lithium de uh, electron deficient materials are used and they do play a significant role in the electrochemistry. Uh, second question. Uh, what is your opinion about the role of superconductor working at room temperature will change the scenario of battery's working capacity? So first of all, supercapacitors and batteries are a different animals. Batteries store the energy within the material. For example, I was showing in the schematic, you have graphite and graphite is a layered structure material. The lithium goes and sit inside. And thermodynamically placing something inside and taking it out takes time. That's why battery takes time to charge and discharge. On the contrary, the supercapacitor, which are typically bigger bodies, they can discharge much rapidly, but stores very small amount of charge. And the reason is supercapacitor stores the charge on the surface. For example, you have very high surface area carbon let's say 1,000 meters square per gram. So the charge, plus minus plus minus charge is stored on the surface that is able to take out and the battery can, uh, supercapacitor can discharge fast. So you get a power from supercapacitor, but you get more energy from the batteries. So they are different. Their working mechanism is different. They cannot replace each other. Let me give you an example. When you have an electric vehicle, and you are at the stop sign. So if you want to really, and you get a green signal now, and you really want to accelerate your vehicle and move forward, battery has a tendency to discharge slowly. When the battery is discharging, the lithium has to physically come from the graphite, go to the parent molecule that is lithium cobalt oxide. It takes time. Thermodynamically, it is impossible to just pull something out. On the contrary, if you have a supercapacitor in the bat, uh, car, that supercapacitor can rapidly discharge, give you the power or thrust needed to propel your car. And as soon as you move forward, then the batteries can kick in and continuously give you energy required to move forward. So those are the different entities. They have different working mechanism 
and they complement each other, but they cannot be replaceable by each other. Uh, sir, in your talk, you said uh, ki batteries are categorized into primary and secondary batteries. So, in primary batteries, which battery comes? So, primary batteries that are the batteries all over your house. For example, if you have a wall clock, <laughs> the, that wall clock has a battery where you put that battery that works, that only discharges one time, and then thereafter you the clock starts working, stops working. So you have to pull out the clock, put that uh, pencil cell again, AA battery or triple A battery or the prismatic uh, cell battery, nine volt battery, or sometimes if you have a wristwatch that has a small battery, or you have a hearing aid that has a primary battery, only discharges and it never charges back. Those are all the primary batteries in different applications. They are really inexpensive but they have only discharging mechanism. You should never charge those batteries back because the mechanism is not made to charge. They could explode very easily. Uh, thank you, sir. You have given the answer of all the questions. Uh, now, I will propose the vote of thanks. Uh, it is indeed my honor to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Bhavan Sagari Mulsumani College of Arts and Science and Jairam Das Patel College of Commerce and Management Studies. I, Dr. Sandeep Main from Chemistry Department, extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who made this session a remarkable event. I am very grateful to Dr. Vilas Pol for agreeing to be the resource person for the session and also delivering a very comprehensive and lucid talk on Can You Live Without Me? Rechargeable Batteries. We are truly overwhelmed with your active participation and look forward to a fruitful association in future as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you all participants. Over to you, Rupa, madam. Thank you, Dr. Mai. We now move on to the second plenary talk. We are pleased to have amongst us Dr. Pankaj Koenkar from Tokushima University, Japan, as the resource person for the second plenary talk. We are now request Mr. Ellen Sarvesai Head Department of Physics to kindly introduce the resource person. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm very happy to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker of the second plenary talk, plenary talk Dr. Pankaj Koinkar. Dr. Pankaj Koinkar completed his PhD in Physics Material Science in 2005 from North Maharashtra University, Chalkov. He then worked as a research associate in the Department of Physics, University of Pune from April April 2005 to September 2005. He subsequently went to Korea University Seoul. <clears throat> and pursued his uh, postdoctoral study from October 2005 to September 2006. He joined the Center for International Cooperation in Engineering Education as an assistant professor, University of Tokushima, Japan in March 2007 and was working there as an assistant professor till March 2016. He's working as associate professor in the Department of Optical Science, uh, Tokushima University, uh, Japan, since April 2016. He's recipient of junior fellowship, uh, research fellowship from uh, through Chief Minister Fund from North Maharashtra University, Jargon, and senior research fellowship, as well as research associate from CSR New Delhi, India. His areas of interest are two-dimensional nanostructures, conducting polymers, laser ablation in liquid, field emission microscopy, and engineering education. He has published more than 85 papers in peer-reviewed international journal, uh, journals. He has received two awards for paper presentation in international conferences. His profound interest in research-related activities is reflected through his contribution as a reviewer for more than 100 scientific journals from elsewhere, uh, Holland, Springer, Germany, American Society of Chemistry, US, and World's Scientific Publications, Singapore. On the final note, he is also a fa fascinating individual, and we are grateful for his presence among us today. I now invite Dr. Pankaj Koinkar uh, to begin his talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you for nice introduction. Uh, 
Dr. Burdes Sardesai. And before starting my talk, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shewale and uh, Principal Rathod for inviting me to deliver this lecture in this international conference. Today, I'm going to talk on the laser assisted uh, synthesis of two dimensional material. I'm working on the two dimensional material from last six years. And we are preparing the two dimensional material using the laser ablation system. So most of the uh, slide will be on the synthesis uh, of the two dimensional materials. And then I will cover there uh, some application in the field of optoelectronic as well. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will talk about Tokushima University where I'm uh, working now. I'm working in Tokushima University from last uh, 14 years. So I will tell you some information about Tokushima University. Then uh, I will move to the two dimensional materials. What kind of two dimensional materials are there? How we can prepare the two dimensional materials? Why they are called as a two dimensional material? Then laser ablation process. Laser ablation, what is the laser ablation? How we are generating the two dimensional material using the laser ablation in liquid. Then I will also show you the synthesis of Indian selenite nanocube. How we have prepared the two dimensional nanocube. When we have the bulk material, how the bulk material is transformed into the two dimensional material. So that I will also show you. And at the end, I will show you some typical two dimensional materials and their uh, optoelectronic properties. And in future, what kind of uh, research we are going to do in our laboratory. So first, uh, let's start with the Tokushima University. This is uh, Japan. Uh, Japan is a very small country. Maybe it is almost same like uh, Maharashtra, if you talk about the population. In Japan, there are four main islands. So first island is Hokkaido. The main island is called as Honshu. And third island is Kyushu. And fourth one is Shikoku. So we are located in Shikoku. Now, this Shikoku island, she means four, and Koku means uh, you can say district or prefectures. So four uh, district or four prefecture. So Tokushima location is here in this Shikoku Island. And the nearest airport for Tokushima is Kansai International Airport. This Kansai International Airport is 180 kilometer away uh, from Tokushima. And it took almost two and a half hour by bus to reach uh, from Kansai Airport to the Tokushima University. So this is the location of uh, Tokushima City. And this is the aerial uh, pictures. Uh, Dr. Paul has shown the good pictures, but uh, I have also uh, aerial photograph of Tokushima University, even though the photo is very small, but you can see this is the aerial uh, photo of Tokushima University. And this campus is called as Josanjima campus, uh, where we have science and technology department. So there are various uh, department in the faculty of technology and science. Uh, this is the administrative building. And these are uh, two photos which shows the various department. I'm sitting in this building at fourth floor now. Uh, this building belong to the optical science. And in our university, we have seven different departments, civil, mechanical, uh, chemistry, biological, electrical, computer, and optical system engineering. So these uh, are the seven department and student can get their uh, graduate degree in the field of intelligent structure, mechanic system, or life and material system, and system innovation engineering. We belong to the College of System Innovation engineering. 
in our university, we have uh, two main campus. One is medical campus and another is uh, technology and science campus. Of course, we have one small uh, uh, faculty also. It is called as integrated art. Uh, we have about 956 uh, faculty members and 9,000 uh, student uh, studying their bachelor, master and doctoral studies and about 638 international students are studying in Tokushima University. There are 1,400 uh, non-teaching staff. Uh, this data is taken from last year's uh, booklet. Uh, so this year, a new data will come because our financial year starts from April 1st. Tokushima University has a collaboration with uh, 92 university from uh, 27 countries. So with this uh, MOUs, we have make several student and faculty exchange to carry out the joint research or to carry out the uh, joint activity of research as well as education. We do send our student for internship and also some faculty member for joint research purposes. So for this, we need international collaboration. And from uh, these 92 partner university, we are getting their support and we can able to do the joint research with these 92 universities. Among these uh, 92 university, we have MOU with four universities, four Indian university, because I belong to the North Maharashtra University, Jalga, where uh, I get my all education, bachelor, master, and doctoral. But most of the research related to my doctoral study was done at Pune University. So after coming to the Japan, I have started this international collaborative activity between the Tokushima University and four Indian University. So we started to sign the MOU with these uh, four university in 2013. Uh, first was from Aurangabad, uh, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar University. So we signed uh, MOU there in 2013. And then at the same year uh, with Pune University also. And after that, North Maharashtra University. And then one of the private university in the Pune called as Bharti University, we have signed the MOU. Under this MOU, many faculty and student uh, have visited Tokushima. At the same time, many students from Tokushima, as well as many teachers from Tokushima visited uh, these four universities for different purposes. And two Indian vice chancellor also visited Tokushima University and I host them. Uh, both of them belong to Jalgaon and Aurangabad. So whenever our uh, guest from India came to Tokushima, we always have Indian flag. When we visit our president, uh, we always host the Indian flag. And this is the Japanese flag and this is the Tokushima flag. And this was our president that time. Uh, and this is our dean uh, when this vice chancellor visited. And this was the Indian vice chancellor. So we, we took photo whenever they visit us and talk about the joint activity between these uh, two university. As a part of this MOU with uh, these four university at this moment uh, in last six, seven years, about 124 participant visited Tokushima for various purposes. For example, uh, joint seminar, uh, summer school, spring school, or any uh, bilateral activity or symposium or maybe joint seminar or conference. So there are 124 Indian visited Tokushima University. Most of them uh, were, were student, about 74 student, then 29 teacher, professor, and some uh, deans or registrar also visited. Uh, two vice chancellor also visited to the Tokushima during this last six years, six, seven years. 
So this is uh, out of these 124 uh, student, most of the student belong to the Pune and North Maharashtra University and Aurangabad. A very few from, uh, I guess, Mumbai also, there were some faculty and uh, some student also visited Fukushima for this uh, joint activity. Now coming to the topic that I'm going to talk on two-dimensional material. So what is a two-dimensional material? So you, if you look at the two-dimensional material, most of you are working in the field of material science. So you immediately know that uh, graphene. Graphene is the first two-dimensional material. And these are the two researchers who got the Nobel Prize for their groundbreaking work on the graphene. In 2010, uh, they got the Nobel Prize because they were the first person who had, who were prepared this graphene in the laboratory. And they have shown that these graphene material can be used for electrical purpose, optoelectrical purpose, for example, field electrical transistor. And then the research on two-dimensional uh, material is started to increase from 2010. And after that, from graphene and beyond graphene, there are several two-dimensional material. Uh, these days are available for the research. So these were the two scientists who got the Nobel Prize. And graphene is very small material. It is in the nanoscale. We cannot see uh, through our eyes. But however, if you want to uh, see the how graphene can be formed, if you want to see through your eyes, it is possible. However, you cannot see the structures. But whenever you are rubbing any kind of pencil on the any simple paper, you are creating thousand millions billions of graphene sheet because when you use your energy. If you listen the first lecture uh, by vice chancellor of ICT, he explained that if you want to break any kind of uh, bond or something, you need energy. So once you have energy, you can break it or you can convert one form into another form. Similarly, when you use your mechanical energy, it is possible that these bonds can break easily. And only this kind of sheet can be separated. When we think about the structures of graphite, these sheets are connected to each other. They are attached to each other. But when you rub the pencil, these bonds are very weak and it is possible to break it. So once they break, you will find such kind of separate sheet. Now these sheets are called as a graphene. So graphene is a single atomic layer of graphite. There is a difference between graphite and graphene. So both material is made up of carbon. But what is the difference? Difference is in their structure. Their structure is different. Now, graphene is the first two-dimensional material. Beyond the graphene, we can prepare several combination of two-dimensional material. It is also called as chalcogenide material, layer chalcogenide material. Why are they called as a layer? Because if you see this single sheet, they are layer material, like paper. If you have one paper, another paper, and one more paper. So these are the sheet-like structure. So we have paper sheet. Similarly, these material arrange in the sheet-like structure. That's why they called as a layered material. So these are the layer two-dimensional material. Sometimes it is called as layer chalcogenide family. So if you want to prepare these two-dimensional material, you have to choose any one atom from transition metal and then select 
anyone from this side or this side or this or this maybe group 3 group 4 or topological insulator like uh, sb or bi or simply chalcogenide one from this transition metal and another from chalcogenide make the combination and then we can prepare several two dimensional material there are 88 possible combination and out of that uh, almost half of the combination are the stable uh, combination of this two dimensional material for example graphene is one of the example but chalcogenate family you need one from transition metal another from chalcogenate so you you can consider one from here any metal for example mo molybdenum and select S from here. So it become molybdenum sulfide. Or you, you select tungsten and then the tungsten cylinder like this. Or bismuth you select or indium. You can select anyone and then you can select another from chalcogenide. So this kind of combination uh, we can choose and prepare uh, these two dimensional material. There are various ways we can prepare this two-dimensional material. Chemical methods as well as physical methods. Since I belong to Department of Optical Science, we choose a physical method to prepare these two-dimensional material. Now, why there is an interest of many researcher to do the research in the field of two dimensional material for various applications graphene now graphene is made up of carbon atom carbon atom is arranged in this manner so it's hexagonal ring now this structures this is one hexagonal ring and i already shown you that this is the way graphene sheet is made up of so out of this, you can see one hexagonal, then attach another hexagonal, then continuously attach to each other. It make a sheet-like structure. So this is the way graphene is formed. Now, in case of molybdenum sulfide, sulfur atom, this sulfur atom is shown by the blue color here. So when you say molybdenum sulfide, two sulfur atom is attached to one molybdenum, like this. Okay. Always two sulfur atom is attached to one molybdenum. Similar structure you can find in WS2. And another interesting material is boron nitride. Now, if you look at the boron nitride structure, it almost look like graphene. But what is the difference? There is a difference. One is boron, another is the nitrogen atom used for boron nitride. In case of graphene, only carbon atom. Then, how about their property? This is the structural uh, difference we have seen. These material, are two dimensional material. These are two dimensional material. Now, whether they conduct electricity, because each material has a different property depending on the their properties. So graphene is a good electrical conductor because zero band gap. Molybdenum is a, like a semiconductor. It can also conduct the electricity. However, boron nitride cannot conduct. It is an insulator. Or another material is bismuth selenite. They are topological insulator material. This material cannot conduct electricity. Application is different for each material. When you talk about the any conducting related application, you prefer graphene or molybdenum. But when you talk about the thermal resistive 
material in the display devices so boron nitride is a possible candidate because they cannot conduct the electricity and they can resist the heat also so the application is different that's why the research purpose is also different there are several reports in last uh, 11 year you will find on two dimensional material right from the synthesis to the various application like uh, fet or solar cell related or energy related materials uh, they have prepared and they they can be used in various electrical as well as uh, optical purposes and these material can show the good performance uh, that can be used for the devices so these are a few example uh, you can find more example on two dimensional materials now this was about the two dimensional material coming to the synthesis process that we are using in our uh, laboratory is called as the laser ablation process so what is the laser ablation process in case of laser ablation process we put a powder simple bulk powder into the glass beaker okay so this is the liquid any kind of organic liquid for example water ethanol methanol ipa and so on so we can choose various materials now this bulk material we put into this liquid and this bulk material is in powder form and the size of this bulk particle is usually in micron so we put the bulk material in the liquid after putting the bulk material into the liquid we started to seal the glass beaker with the lid or cap and then we use ndag laser this is nanosecond laser this is nanosecond laser so nanosecond laser means it has a pulse of nanosecond about 10 nanosecond so every 10 nanosecond there is one pulse and the energy of that laser pulse is about 50 millijoule you can say 500 milliwatt is the energy of laser pulse now this energy is used to irradiate or ablate the bulk sample once we start the laser for certain time let's say five minute 10 minute 20 minute sometime one hour or two hour depending on the sample so once this laser irradiate the surface of bulk material the upper part of bulk material is removed and then we can get the formation of 2d nanostructure 2d nanostructure here so this is very simple uh, phenomena occurs in the laser ablation I will explain uh, physically how it happened. So laser energy is used to remove the material from the target. So our target material was this bulk powder material. Now this nanosecond laser, once it hit the surface of bulk material or target material, there are various physical process phenomena occurs at the surface of bulk material such as melting evaporation ionization of the bulk material so this nanosecond laser it hit this target material this target material is hit by the nanosecond laser now this green part is the pulse 10 nanosecond pulse once that laser hit the surface of bulk material there is a creation of plasma plum 
here, this part. Okay, this part is the plasma plug. And since the laser has certain energy, certain energy, it can go deeper, more deeper to the surface of bulk material. And that create a plasma plum. Now, with this creation of plasma plum, some part from the surface is removed. Of course, during this process, there are shock wave also created. Shock wave is a similar like you throw a stone into the river. Once you throw the stone into the river, you find there are water wave. Circular water wave is created. Similarly, once laser hit the this bulk material inside the liquid, there is a creation of shock wave also. So with this, we can see the formation of nanoparticle, those are coming out from the surface of bulk material. This was for nanosecond. Now, for picosecond or femtosecond. So nano means 10 to the power 9 second. And pico is 10 to the power minus 12 second. Femto means 10 to the power minus 15. So the pulse time is reducing here. If you reduce the pulse time, the heat affected area is smaller for pico or femtosecond. Of course, once this plasma is uh, created here, the area is small for this femto and pico. For nano, it is bigger. So different kind of structure can be formed during this nanosecond laser ablation or pico or femtosecond laser ablation. Also, you can see the area of shock wave is less as compared to nanosecond. Now, using this laser ablation, we have synthesized indium selenide nanocube. So what we have done, we use the bulk indium selenide powder, and that was about one micron to two micron in size. The sheet of this bulk material is one, two, or three micron. We put this powder into the liquid medium, liquid was water. And then we irradiate, we ablated this indium selenide using the nanosecond laser. Now during the laser ablation here, energy was 620 milliwatt. And the wavelength of the laser is 520. We ablate this sample for first five minutes and we stop the laser then we take out the sample we have taken the acm after that we irradiate another sample for 10 minutes then 15 minutes and 20 minutes now with the change in the time you can see how the morphology is changing First five to 10 minutes, you find there is a formation of big rod-like structures. So you can see these rod-like structures. Then after 10 minutes, this rod is converting into the spherical form, spherical form. So there is a size reduction from five minutes to 10 minutes. For 15 minutes, now for 15 minutes, these spherical as well as some rod like particle transform into the cubical particle. But the transformation just begin around 15 minutes. And after 20 minutes, totally transform into the cubical form. So this was the 
process occurs during the laser ablation. When we started the experiment, we directly start with 20 minutes. Then we don't know how this formation occurs. Then we have done the experiment step by step. We go for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and 20 minutes. And then we understand how the growth mechanism occurs through the laser ablation. So finally, at the end of 20 minutes, we got the cubical indium nanocellular. So here, after getting this structure, we tried for various application also. Now this is the bulk material as I was telling you, it is about one micron to two micron in the size. And this is the TM image of nanocube. So you can see the phases clearly, okay? Since these are the TM image, you can see a two dimensional image. But if you lo look more closer, you can see this is one side and this is another side like this. So these are the cube of indium selenide. And this paper was published in October 2020 in ACS Applied Nanomaterials. You can find more detail uh, by looking at this paper. And we have also carried out its EDS. We want to see whether the structure was same because through EDS, uh, we have seen we can get the similar kind of spectra. So structure remain intact. Of course, we have also done uh, the Raman uh, UV visible to confirm the formation of structures. And we believe that the structure was intact. It was not converted into the any other form of indium selenide or simply indium or simply selenide. It was indium selenide. So you can see from this uh, TM image, bulk and nanocube. Then we have seen the field emission property of this indium selenide nanocube. Now, indium selenide nanocube, we have tried for the bulk material. The bulk material means for this is the bulk material. Okay. This is the bulk material or this is the bulk material. When we tried the bulk material, the current was only up to here, about 400 something, 400, uh, sorry, 400 microampere. The current density was only 400 microampere per centimeter. And for this indium selenide nanocube, the current was about 2.7. 2.7 milliampere. So this change is occur because of the nanometric structure. We can get the more potential side for electron to tunnel from the surface. So from this side, electron can easily tunnel. But for this bulk material, it was not possible because this bulk material is attached like a sheet-like structure, they are layer material. So only first sheet participate in the field emission, but in case of cubic, they are well separated and electron can tunnel from the edges. Separate, they can tunnel, they are, so they can contribute for the electron emission. That's why uh, we can get the higher current density for this cubical material. And we also uh, seen the stability. So it was almost uh, stable at certain voltage. So such material can be used for field emission or display devices since its electrical properties improved. Now, next part is optoelectrical property of other two dimensional nanomaterial. Earlier we try 
indium selenide and this time we tie bismuth selenide using the laser ablation in liquid. So this is again the bulk material. Now bulk material was uneven. In this uh, case, it was uneven. You can see big particle, you can see small and small. So we crush it for two hours. And after crushing, we make a fine powder. This fine powder we put into the liquid. Now in this case, uh, we have used IP, isopropyl alcohol. In earlier case, it was water. Now you are saying why you use water in earlier case and why you have used IPA. We try water here, but we could not able to get the any kind of new structures. So that's why here we have changed the liquid and we use IPA. So when we use IPA, we have seen the change in the structure. So what kind of structure that I will show you soon. After the laser ablation, for certain time in earlier experiment, it was 20 minutes. For this experiment, it was two hours. Because the quantity of the bulk uh, sample was bigger here. That's why we use the laser ablation time for about two hours. This is the bulk sample before the laser ablation. Now you can see the bulk sample color is a black. When we put into the bottle before the laser ablation, we can see it like this. And after laser ablation, you can see change in color. So this is the first sign uh, which shows that the structure has been changed. So after that, we can have various uh, analysis such as uh, UV visible, ACM, TM, or Raman, and we confirm that such kind of structure is uh, also bismuth selenide. Now, this is the bulk material. Okay, so this bulk material, again, it's a sheet like material, layer material, totally convert into the rod like structure. Now, this rod-like structures and this was the sheet-like structure. So this is bigger sheet and this is the rods. Now, how this change occurs after 120 minutes or two hours? So whenever we see any change, there is a possible growth mechanism. So when we talk about the laser ablation, there are two possible possibility. One is reduction, another is fragmentation. So in case of reduction, when you use the laser, when laser is hit the surface of target material, it can convert, transform immediately into the small particle nucleus center then they can agglomerate together and form the nanoparticle. This is one of the possible mechanism. And another is the fragmentation. Like this bulk sheet is break into the smaller sheet. After certain time, again, these smaller sheet convert into the smaller or nano sheets. If you look at this structure, we believe that here the fragmentation is occur. The way this material is cut, okay, the way it is cut uneven. So it's not like uniform formation like this. So we believe that this transformation is because of the fragmentation of bulk material. So this bulk material is transformed into the nano rod and we can able to see the these nano rods after 120 minutes. How much time do I have now? Hello? Sir, 15 minutes, sir. 
15 minutes okay okay so in our case for this uh, bismuth uh, selenide fragmentation mechanism was the correct uh, possibility to grow these nano rods and we also tried its field emission for bulk sample it was 408 micro ampere per centimeter square it's a current density and after the for the laser ablated sample it was 647 and these are the optical image you can see very few uh, sites are emitted very few current uh, is drawn but here you can see there are many sites where electron is drawn and because of this we can get the more current density this also again because of the nanometric structures we have also done uh, some research on molybdenum sulfide so molybdenum sulfide uh, is another two dimensional material this is the bulk material this was the bulk material and this was ablated for 20 minute and this was for 120 minute as we increase the time the molybdenum sheets reduces into the smaller size so here for 20 minute the size was little bigger but for 120 it was changing into the smaller nano size then we again uh, done its field emission and we found that for 120 minute the current density is high because of its a uh, structure nano structure uh, the sheets are well separated from each other and uh, through raman spectra uh, we can see the structure is remain as it is however in the bulk material when we purchase the bulk material uh, there was some moo3 after laser ablation the purification happen because the reduce in the intensity we can see there is a purification of mo O3 or removal of mo O3 from the substrate and this peaks intensity is improved that shows there was two possibility for the higher current density one possibility was the nanometric uh, structure another was removal of mo O3 and this nano sheet can also uh use a better current density however so far now i have shown you three different material the first was indium selenide the second was bismuth selenide the third is molybdenum sulfide now among these three till today we have got the good current density from indium selenide material because of its structure as a cube okay because sheet is converted into a cube and electron from all sides of cube is participating that's why we got the more current and these are the few paper uh, published in this journal in 2018 so you can see on zoom scale how this nano sheet can be formed we have also done a uh, experiment with uh, tungsten sulfide so tungsten sulfide is another uh, material but this time we have used nanosecond laser and femtosecond laser so what is the difference when we use the nanosecond and femtosecond so if you remember the earlier slide where i have shown you that if the nanosecond laser is there you can get more heat affected areas but for femto less 
it affected areas even the shock wave area is small because the pulse duration is different and energy are also different in case of nanosecond the laser energy varies from 500 milliwatt to 650 milliwatt but in case of femtosecond uh, 3 milliwatt to 30 milliwatt so it's 20 time less so what is the difference on their surface morphology you you can see here this is the bulk material and this is the nanosecond laser ablated material and this is femto in case of nanosecond of course the size is reduced but the sheets are attached to each other the sheets are attached to each other and in case of femto they are well separated if you look at the acm image or even tm the particle looks like circular and they are separated so if you look at acm or even tm uh, even though this image is very small for you but these are well separated from each other in case of femto laser so why they are well separated because the area is small one by one uh, those particle can be removed easily but in case of nanosecond laser uh, the area is bigger so on bigger scale this laser ablation occurs that's why they can stay together now this is the laser regime effect if we use nanosecond or femtosecond we can get a different uh, kind of uh, surface morphology uh, we have also tried its uh, field effect transistor behavior and we can see that even though the bismuth selenide is topological material uh, it is possible to get the good linear behavior uh, because of the charge conduction due to the electron now i told you that bismuth selenide is insulator but when it goes to the nano structure when it goes to the nano structures it might possible that it act as a semiconductor it act as a semiconductor and uh, at this moment we are uh, also doing uh, some research on various uh, material using femto laser or nano second laser uh, molybdenum we are trying bismuth sulfide the material we are trying and with the help of nanosecond and femtosecond we have obtained a good result uh, of various morphology nano sheet nano particle nano ropes nano tubes uh, and we are trying to understand their uh, growth mechanism and in future we will able to uh, see their uh, application in various field especially we want to uh see their opto electronic applications or energy related application so with this uh, i want to close my talk here in future we want to develop more uh, powerful two dimensional material to exploit their uh, possible uh, application in various field and i would like to thank my uh, collaborator and group leader uh, for contributing in this research and thank you to my graduate student who are, are doing a uh, good research and that's why i can able to show uh, these slides to you thanks to all of them thank you very much to you uh, finally uh, since i am in tokushima from last 14 years uh, i am organizing various activity uh, such as uh, spring school summer school for student Uh, those who want to come to tokushima for this event they are come or also i can uh, organize some event like sakura program so these three program i am the coordinator in tokushima and next year we have two uh, international conference hopefully corona will improve and we can able to see you in tokushima face to face in may 2022 and in december 2022 so thank you very much for your attention
any questions thank you very much sir thank you immensely firstly for giving us a virtual tour of tokushima university and also for your very detailed and impressive presentation thank you very much i now request uh, mr ashok ingle treasurer to kindly moderate the question and answer session followed by vote of thanks Uh, thank you, sir. Um, thank you for your inspiring speech and exciting presentation. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, uh, first question we will take it. Uh, what is the difference between the graphene and fullerene? Can there be sheets formed by the fullerene? Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Graphene uh, is a sheet-like structure, uh, but fluorine is a, like a soccer ball. Okay? okay, so graphene sheet is a plain sheet like a paper. When you imagine the hexagonal ring are attached to each other in one single plane. Okay, like this horizontally. So those are graphene. But if this sheet is wrapped together okay if the sheet is wrapped together and it form a structure like soccer ball then it is a fluorine but this fluorine is also called as c60 because there is a combination of hexagonal and pentagonal ring so those combination of hexagonal and pentagonal ring uh, it can make a soccer ball like a football ball like structure that is called as a fluorine. And what was uh, your another uh, question? Yes. Uh, while selecting the opto electronic material synthesis, what are the various important properties we have to consider? And I think you have, uh, you have mentioned that you have selected Indian selenite. So, what are the specific reasons that you have selected this Indian selenite? We are uh, selecting the material uh, and we are looking forward for the energy related uh, like property or application. Mostly we want to see the how we can uh, see the electron transfer mechanism. So our aim is to see the electron transfer mechanism uh, of this two dimensional material, how electron can emit how electron can transfer. That is our ultimate aim. And we have selected indium selenide because indium selenide uh, has not been uh, tried by many researchers. And interestingly, um, this was the first report on indium selenide for field emission purposes. Uh, as I told you, the two dimensional material research started from the graphene. And then it's moved to the molybdenum sulfide, tungsten sulfide. And now it is shifting to other uh, material also. Because there are so many other uh, reports are available of MOS2 or WS2 and possible mechanism or maybe possible application. We want to try for another material that can be uh, useful for particular optoelectronic uh, application. We also want to see its behavior in the field of photo detector. So these are the future direction uh, we will move for uh, energy related application, uh, electron transfer mechanism, and also photo detector uh, applications. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, excuse me, sir. Can I ask one question? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes. uh, I uh, I would like to ask the question which was halfly answered about yeah. the fullerene structure. Yes. yes. The uh, first part of the question was answered that uh, fullerene is a buckyball. Yes. Uh, but the another part is can we make it into a sheet so that it can also have the optoelectronic or ah, optical yes, yes. okay, okay. properties? Okay. 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 Uh, th that is uh, okay. That is possible. But uh, as I uh, told you that. If we can break the structures, now they are wrapped. For example, if you look at indium uh, selenide nanocube, this was the sheet and 
now convert into the cube. So can that cube again convert into the sheet? Uh, we need to see. We have not tried such experiment, but it will be interesting if the traditional material, which is already set material, whether we can use these material and convert into the sheet. There is a possibility, but I'm not sure about how to do it and how about the stability. Okay. It is Thank possible. You, sir. Yeah. So one last question, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, can this method be used for three dimensions? You are used for two dimensions. Can this be used for two, three dimensions materials? Yeah, it is possible. It is possible. We can use this for uh, three dimension also. It is uh, possibility. Okay. Possibility. It is possible. Okay. Okay. So one one more last simple question there. Yes. Uh, you are doing a very good work, but uh, if some student uh, does it require the high level research facilities? to perform such kind of research? Or what are the minimum requirement that we can start research on this topic? You, you need, a, you need a laser system. If you have a laser system, you, you can okay. do it. Only you need laser. However, the laser maybe price is uh, quite expensive. Uh, I guess it will be 70 to 80 lakh uh, in Indian rupees. So if you get the laser, then rest of the thing is not uh, difficult. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for your um, exciting and inspiring talk. Thank you. So, uh, it is my uh, it is indeed my honor to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Bhavan's Hazarimal Somali College of Arts and Science and Jarandas Patel College of Commerce and Management Studies. I, Mr. Ashok Ingle, Assistant Professor from Physics Department, extend my heartfelt gratitude to all those who made this session a remarkable event. I am grateful to Dr. Pangaj Koinkar for agreeing to be the resource person for this session and also delivering a very exciting talk on the laser-based synthesis of two-dimensional nanomaterials towards optoelectric devices. Sir, we are truly overwhelmed with your active participation and look forward to a fruitful association in the future as well. Thank you once again, sir. Thank you for your nice presentation. Thank you very Both much. You, Thank, Thank you. Very. Thank you, Mr. Ingle. We now move on to plenary talk. I call upon Dr. Vijay Hille, Head of Botany Department, to introduce the resource person, Dr. Jitendra Gaikwar from Frederick Schiller University, Germany, for the third plenary talk. Dr. Hille, you are mute. Hille, sir. And media mm -hmm. Yes. Good afternoon, one and all. It's my privilege to introduce the resource person, Dr. Jitendra Gaikwad, Frederick Scheller University, Germany, for the third plenary talk in the International Conference on Fundamental and Applied Sciences, ICFAS 2021. Mr. Gaikwad has a bachelor and master's degree in botany from Mumbai University and has received a PhD degree in biodiversity informatics from Macquarie University, Australia. At present, he is working as a senior biodiversity informatics scientist at the Friedrich Scheller University, Jena, Germany. In India, Dr. Mm -hmm. Gaikwad has worked as a biodiversity informatics researcher at the National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, and Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. Dr. Gaikwad has over 16 years of research and management experience in the field of biodiversity informatics. His areas of work include data strategy, architecture, and governance, biodiversity research data management, and application of novel computational techniques to address biodiversity research questions. He had published many research articles 
in globally renowned journals and had supervised several research students. Dr. Gaikwad is one of the author of the vision document, National Biodiversity Information Outlook 2012. This was significant for building a national information infrastructure as it was essential for India to make from the national biodiversity released by prime minister of during the convention of parties meeting held in bangalore india dr gaikwad has has been proactively involved in different capacities for more than decade with various international entities such as the Biodiversity Information Facility, Atlas of Australia, and Ocean Biodiversity Information System. Search Biodata is so enriching and inspiring that it was really challenging to summarize in a limited time. We are indeed fortunate to have such a versatile personality with us. May I now request Dr. Jitendra Gai to deliver on biodiversity research data management overview and introduction. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hile. Uh, I would like to share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank the principal of the Bhavans Hazarimal Somani College, Professor Rathod, uh, the convener of this conference, Dr. Sandeep uh, Mind, and the organizing secretary, Dr. Uh, Suraj Gajbiye, for inviting me to give a plenary talk at this conference. Uh, in this talk, I would broadly present some important points related to the data management in the field of biodiversity science. And hopefully we'll be able to ignite some interest and curiosity about the data management topic, uh, which typically is beyond the scope of the curriculum in the life sciences domain, at least in India. Uh, today, the biodiversity science is becoming highly data driven. So if you are a researcher, teacher, or a student who plans to get into biodiversity of life science research, then it is crucial that you understand uh, the significance of data management and why you should take it seriously. Uh, so before I proceed, I just wanted to, ens want to ensure that I'm uh, audible well. Uh, is that okay? Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah okay, great. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so uh, we all know uh, biodiversity is the diversity of species on our planet, but also of genes, functions, ecological interaction and ecosystem. Uh, as shown in this graph, uh, we all are aware that globally biodiversity is declining at a very fast rate. Along with the loss of biodiversity, we are also losing the ecosystem services provided by the biodiversity. So how bad is the loss of biodiversity and why we should be bothered about the loss of biodiversity and its ecosystem services? As you can see here, only 10% of the species are known to science, uh, while the remaining is still undiscovered. It is predicted that by 2200, almost 50% of species will be lost without us even knowing what is lost since it is not known to science. Uh, along with this will also uh, disappear potential uh, ecosystem services and resources provided by the biodiversity, such as food, medicine, good quality air, water, pristine natural area for recreation, etc. Uh, in the recently published uh, global assessment report by the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, uh, it is indicated that there are data and knowledge gaps associated with various aspects of biodiversity. And as a result, certain assessment could not be done or are inconclusive. 
apparently this means our assessment and management of biodiversity is as good as the available or accessible data and information so for example to understand and address biodiversity associated questions uh, such as to determine how many and which species exist potentially we will need taxonomic data plot inventories remote sensing data for understanding why do species co occur we would need species range distribution data phylogenetic data and maybe fossil data next to understand why species co exist we will need functional plant prey data phylogenetic distances etc going further to determine uh, at an ecosystem level how do species jointly function the the data requirement could be like net product uh, primary productivity data soil carbon inventories remote sensing etc and finally to determine if the species diversity buffers climate change we would need data such as climate models land cover and experimental data so these are just few examples uh, apart from the data requirement the biggest challenge is how to find integrate and use these different types of data that could be used for analysis uh, which potentially could also lead to better sustainable conservation policy so a good data management practice is key to address these challenges so now uh what is this data management that we are talking about uh, it's simply put it uh, data management refers to all aspects of creating housing delivering maintaining and archiving and preserving data it is one of the essential areas of responsible conduct of research uh it sounds quite straightforward and simple uh, but let me show you why it is not so uh some experts say uh, there is a deluge of data but then why are we faced with a situation where pertinent data and information on biodiversity is not easily accessible and usable so let's look at some of the reasons uh people collect biodiversity data in diverse ways such as field surveys experimental and using sensors or data provided by citizen science or crowd source so there is a data collection diversity there is a diversity in how uh, different ways in which people collect data uh, the collected data is in different quantities as you can see here manually collected data is less in volume as compared to data generated by automated sensors and crowd source so there is also a diversity of volume the data is collected by researchers in different formats types and structures so depending on how the data was collected the heterogeneity changes apart from high diversity of uh, biodiversity data the other challenges are that the data is highly fragmented or distributed many times the data is trapped in non digital formats in cupboards of organizations and universities uh, findability is a big bottleneck which leads to inaccessibility to relevant data and information so from uh, further the situation gets complicated uh, due to the diversity of software used for generating data and formats it is stored in uh, so uh, even if you find the data it is likely that it will be difficult to use or will be unusable so to avoid the frustrating situation what is required are the skill sets for efficient management of biodiversity data and information so for example let's look at the data collection and data structuring activities uh, typical activities uh the way we organize the data uh, this is typically how we save and organize our data or result files on our computers yeah so test retest re retest so there are different versions uh, that you end up having so Uh, which are not optimally organized so this results in spending a lot of unnecessary efforts finding the correct version of the data set when required sometimes due to such chaotic organizations researchers also end up losing the data set and uh, losing a data set can be a terrible thing or a, a, a horrible event if you are doing your phd or you are doing any kind of research because your research is basically depending on your data the analysis part especially now let's look at the structuring of the data in a file so here you can see there are three data sets or three collect uh, uh, collection events 
So when we look at the structuring of the data, consistency is always a common issue. As you can see in this example, data is structured in different ways uh, with lots of inconsistencies. So location of date information, date format is inconsistent, column names are incons inconsistent, uh, and then how the way they are ordered or structured in a file. Uh, and then uh, we have inconsistencies between data collection events. So misspelling, site spelling, uh, then the code of the sites are very different. So there is no consistency there. Uh, as you can see here, mean one, which is under weight and mean one is under the column species. So, uh, and then you have uh, text and number in same column. So what, what is the mean of 12 and S kept uh, more than 15? So there's a lot of inconsistency here. Having a consistent data structure, column names, formats, and use of terms is very important uh, to understand and use the data set. Also, it saves a lot of efforts uh, if you want to use the data set after a few months or years. And also, it is easy to process with programming languages uh, such as Java or PHP or analysis software such as R, MATLAB, SPSS, etc. So it's a good practice to have uh, the data uh, structured uh, properly. Uh, this is another example of a data set associated with a journal article uh, downloaded from the Dryad repository. So what you see here are the names of the variable in the data set. So uh, that doesn't give me any information of what the data set is about. In the same data set, there are table containing the data and you cannot easily understand the context, uh, quality and use of the data. But one would suggest uh, that the information needed to understand the data set is in the publication associated with this data set, uh, but not really. So uh, what Dryad gives you is uh, from the data repository, what you get as the information about the data set is the title, uh, the metadata, which is the description that is almost missing, uh, the title of the publication, uh, which is underlying uh, this data, and a link to underlying publication. So nothing much there. Uh, but why does this happen? Why people tend to not provide a lot of uh, description so that you can understand uh, the data? Uh, it's, so there is something called information entropy or DK. And uh, uh, what, what it is like, okay, uh, on uh, on uh, on vertical axis you have data details and on the horizontal axis you have time. So when you start to develop uh, or create the data set, you have a very high memory of you know every bits and pieces of your data. But as the time passes by, you lose you lose that information, you lose the memory, and you don't remember uh, the details of that data. Uh, so you lose the specific details as the time goes by. And then there are different events that probably could happen. So maybe the technology changed or your hard disk died or it got corrupted. So suddenly your data is lost there. And then uh, if, if there is a professor who is holding a lot of data, he's retired and he has not ensured that the data is available to others. So with the retirement, even the, uh, the data that he has collected over his period of uh, uh, professional life is also gone. So like that, the data is lost. Uh, and uh, the loss of data developer leads to loss of remaining information as well. So the solution to avoid this uh, situation is to provide a high quality description of the data as early as, as possible. And the description not only should be high quality, but also standardized, uh, understandable by machines and humans. In short, it means that you should write a good metadata that describes the data set uh, sufficiently. Uh, so what is metadata? So try to think of some examples in everyday life uh, that have metadata associated with, with them. A few examples might include library card catalogs and food labels. Uh, so card catalogs tells us more information than just the title of the book. They also tells the user who is the author, who published the book, what subject uh, area does the book fall in, and finally, where it is located in the library. 
Another example of metadata that we see in our uh, daily lives is the nutrition and ingredient uh, information on food labels. Uh, nutrition labels answers questions such as, what is the juice made of? Uh, who made the juice? How many calories per serving? How many servings in the can, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so it is basically describing the content of the book or the bottle. So let's specifically look at metadata component within the biodiversity domain in more detail to understand its significance. Uh, as mentioned earlier, one of the biggest challenges is how to understand highly diverse biodiversity data and share it for various uh, scientific purposes. To facilitate seamless exchange and understanding of biodiversity data, both by machines and humans, data standards are required. Uh, biodiversity Information Standards is an international nonprofit organization uh, consisting of experts from life sciences and computer sciences uh, which develops uh, data standards for biodiversity data. So for example, uh, it is something similar to uh, Bureau of Indian Standards, uh, which provides ISI certification mark on consumer products that are made according to the Indian standard. Uh, similarly, the biodiversity information standards uh, has developed several data standards for biodiversity data, uh, which can be used for efficient exchange, understanding and interpretation of data, such as the commonly used Darwin Core, which is a list of uh, standardized terms to used to describe the variable names related to species, taxonomy, publication, uh, occurrence of species, observation of species, uh, species sampling event, and spatial component. Then depending on the context of the data, uh, there are other data standards such as Audubon Core for multimedia data, uh, ABCD for biological collections data, then you have economic botany data for eco economically important plants, etc. cetera. Uh, now ecological metadata language is a metadata standard uh, developed by and for the ecological discipline or ecological domain. Uh, it is used to describe the data so that the people can understand what the data is all about. Uh, so to simply put, uh, metadata is analogous to journalistic reporting. Uh, metadata is data about the data. It describes the content, quality, condition, and other characteristics of data, which is useful for understanding the data set. Uh, metadata is of critical importance uh, since it not only helps to understand the data produced by others, but if you create properly, can also fetch you a highly citable scientific publications based on your collected data set. Uh, this also serves the purpose of gaining in incentive and credits for the effort that the researchers have invested for producing the data set. Uh, around 2010, 2011, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility Data Publishing Framework Task Group provided uh, recommendations in order to facilitate fast mobilization of biodiversity data and provide incentives to researchers for the data activities that they undertake. The task group proposed a mechanism to publish data as a peer-reviewed scientific publication. Uh, it is similar to conventional peer-reviewed scientific publications, but instead of describing the analysis or the study, the data is described. In short, it is a well-documented metadata, which is nothing but information about the data. Apparently from the same research activity, potentially you can have two publications, the one describing the study and uh, study and analysis while the other describing the metadata. Uh, many publication houses uh, have adopted this recommendation and we now have a number of uh, journals uh, which are into data publications, uh, such as Biodiversity Data Journal, uh, which was the first journal that started publishing data articles. Uh, there are some more like Biota Columbiana and uh, Scientific Data from Nature Publishing Group. Uh, there are a few more which publishes data paper. Uh, it's quite a big list. A uh, lot of researchers are publishing uh, high quality data through these peer reviewed journals and making it digitally available for people to use it and also getting credit for uh, publishing since they are getting cited. 
Uh, I highly recommend uh, research students and teachers to publish uh, uh, biodiversity data papers since it uh, enhances your credibility and research profile. Uh, in future, uh, researchers will not only be evaluated based on how many research publications they have, but also will be taken into account how many data set publications they have or software and non-traditional research products are published. So uh, now we are moving towards a more uh, open science uh, direction. So the benefits of uh, good data management can be ripped in uh, short and long term. Uh, for example, in short term, uh, researchers uh, spend less time managing their data and more time on the uh, research. Also, it uh, becomes for the researchers and collaborators to understand the collected data. It's easy for them to understand. In long term, researchers who are outside your project uh, will be able to understand the data if they want to reuse it, even after 10 years. Uh, uh, so here the uh, information decay or the information entropy is taken care by doing this. Uh, this also means that if the data is reused, then it gets cited as we saw, and the data creator also gets the credit. Uh, funding agencies are making it strictly mandatory for researchers, at least in Europe and America, to efficiently manage the data using best practices. Uh, data generation uh, is an expensive activity in terms of money and effort. So by doing so, they also want to protect the investment that they have made in the project and want to ensure the data is available for long term. Uh, from policy making perspective also, it is important uh, that researchers manage biodiversity data properly and make it available and usable for uh, developing policies. As we saw uh, before that, uh, the policies are as good as the underlying data. Now, coming from global to the national level, uh, India is a emerging economy, uh, biodiversity hotspot and mega biodiverse country where the rich biological diversity is declining at an unprecedented rate. Uh, natural resources have huge economic value and the uh, challenge is to sustain it while promoting economic growth. Uh, thus, there are increasing demands from decision makers for reusable biodiversity data. Uh, to minimize the data and information gaps, it is crucial for biodiversity and life science researchers and students to make research uh, data management an integral part of their scientific activity and academic curriculum. Apparently, data is a new currency and efficient data management practice is the cornerstone of biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. Uh, I would like to once again thank the organizers and my colleagues from the Frederick Schiller University for support and encouragement. And thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your very impressive presentation with a lot of insights. May I now call upon Dr. Suraj Tajpiye, Organizing Secretary, to moderate the Q&A session, followed by a vote of thanks. Thank you, Madam. Over to you, Suraj, sir. Sir, there is one question. Which are the major problems facing? Sir, Sorry, Dr. Gajbi, I could not hear you properly. Uh... Hello, sir. Hello. 
सर क्वेश्चन इज दैट विच आर द मेजर प्रॉब्लम फेसिंग ड्यूरिंग बायोडाइवर्सिटी डेटा कलेक्शन ओके सो वन इज सो द बिगेस्ट प्रॉब्लम इज द डेटा मैनेजमेंट प्लानिंग डेटाशन बटोरहैंड so for example uh, if you want to do data collection then you need to have a plan about uh, what are the variables on which you are going to collect data uh, how are you going to collect data uh, then in what format are you going to store it are you going to write it on a notebook or you are going to put it in an excel sheet uh, uh, then uh, what would be the description of your variables so if i am having a data set which you cannot understand uh then uh, there is no use uh then uh, that is something that you have to take care during your data management planning especially for the data collection event like uh, describing it how are you going to share your data or under what licenses and terms and conditions you want to share the data how are you going to analyze the data what is really required for your analysis how are you going to store your data Uh, so sometimes people say i have my data on the usb stick but then it is lost somewhere and you don't have a backup and then a whole three years of your phd are gone with that usb stick so having a plan is uh, is is a major thing to have before you start any data activity thank you sir sir one more question uh, how this field is useful to young scientists and researchers okay uh, so traditionally uh, let's say uh, in 18th 19th century we were everything on the books so in this so from uh, last 10 decade or so last one or two decades things are be- becoming really data driven especially by the science so people are no more only looking at uh, individual looking at taxonomy or uh, let's say ecolo- ecological functioning of a system but now they are using lot of different data like remote sensing uh, trait data taxonomic data uh, molecular data omics especially and now uh, if we want to integrate all this data which is coming from different sources uh, in different format it has different meaning uh, so you need to understand how to do the data management uh, using standard terms and uh, things are going to get more data driven so science is becoming more data driven and you need to understand as a young scientist or a researcher if you are moving in 21st century how to manage your data uh, it is a skill set it is something like uh, when, when you are in the kindergarten uh, or in first standard you you learn how to write a b c d and then as you go on you read big text so it is something like that so when you are getting into the highly data domain then you need to know the data management skills so that you can do your research properly without wasting energy or without getting frustrated or having a big collaboration so it's really important that you understand uh, or know what is uh, efficient data management hello sir sir uh, How, how the satellite apar data are accessed by any uh, researcher yes sir uh, can, can you please uh, repeat the question uh, dr gajpati yes sir if anybody can do uh, anybody are doing research then how the satellite apar uh data are accessed by that particular researcher uh sir unmute yourself um uh, 
गायकवाड सर अनम्यूट युअर सेल्फ यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल गायकवाड सर एम आई ऑडिबल नाउ या 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 यस सर यस सर ओके सॉरी uh so there are a uh, lot of different data portals uh so in india we have ipro uh then there are nasa data portals which are especially dedicated to uh, providing data and services so that people can download then there are uh, uh european space agency's uh, data portals where you have different uh, data products based on let's say the resolution or the spectral uh sensors that were used uh for so for example ndvi uh, vegetation index uh then you have terrain data and all those things so there are a lot of uh, uh spatial data available uh, from this uh, different websites or data portals i would say as compared to biodiversity the spatial or the gis and remote sensing community is quite advanced in terms of providing data in standardized way and formats सर डेटा कलेक्शन इज अ वेरी इजी जॉब बट द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ डेटा इज टेडियस यूर इन्फॉर्मेटिव टॉक ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ भवंस हजारीमल सोमानी कॉलेज आई एम वेरी ग्रेटफुल टू डॉक्टर जितेंद्र गायक फॉर फॉर एग्रींग टू बी द रिसोर्स पर्सन फॉर दिस सेशन एंड डिलीवरिंग अ वेरी कॉम्प्रेसिव एंड लुसिड टॉक ऑन बायोडाइवर्सिटी रिसोर्स डेटा मैनेजमेंट or view and introduction we are truly overwhelmed with your active participation and look forward to your to fruitful association in future as well sir thank you very much once again thank you thank you very much for having me thank you dr you ma'am thank you dr gajbie we now break for lunch and meet again at 2 pm sharp there will be two parallel sessions post lunch session 1a for chemical sciences and session 1b for material sciences the links for both the parallel sessions uh, will be shared on the chat right now and they are also available on the telegram group so participants are kindly requested to join the respective sessions at 2 pm thank you thank you very much